All right, thank you. Item 1.3 is approval of the agenda. I move to approve the agenda. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor of approval, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Chair votes aye and the agenda is approved. Item 1.4 is introduction of our student board member. All right, Mr. Anderson. Hello, thank you for being here, everyone. Um, I am going to introduce our board member. Uh, this is her second time hanging out with us at the at the table. Um, that is Catherine Weiner. Catherine is a junior at Elko High School. I'm going to read some cool stuff about Catherine. Catherine is the president and co-founder of the Elko High School Book Club. She is the co-captain of the Elko High School speech and debate team, which did okay at their competition. Yeah. I remember reading your name quite a few times, actually, when I was reading the accolades from that. Way to go. Um, she is a varsity member and state qualifier for the EHS girls golf team. She's the junior class girls representative of EHS student council. She's member of the EHS key club, member of the national honor society and member of the international thespian society and the EHS drama club, which also did an okay job at their competition. Um, and, uh, Lost boy in Peter Pan. I'm trying to remember what you were in Peter Pan. I was a pirate. <laughs> pirate. That's right. One of those groups of troublemakers. All right. She was one of the pirates. Uh, did a great job in the performance of Peter Pan. Um, and Catherine currently has a 4.0 or 4.4. Yes, GPA. Uh, she plans on attending college in the fall of 2024 at the University of Pennsylvania and then law school at Harvard in the fall of 2028. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you for having me. Yeah. All right, well, Catherine, we're glad to have you back. And so you know the drill. Um, anytime you have some input, we would love to hear it. You are representing the students. Your voice is what we love to hear. So again, welcome. All right, we'll move to item 1.5, which is our spring sports recognitions. And part of the room is full of athletes that we have loved to watch. So I believe we will start with the Elko High School girls. Um, do we have do we have the coach here? Okay. All right. Would you like to introduce your students and give them their certificates, and then um, they can come along? So what we'll do is is your coach will introduce you, and then you guys can come along and we'll shake your hand and tell you congratulations because it is awesome to have so many state champions in this room and um, also regional all, all the titles. You guys did amazing. So we'll go ahead and start here. Hans, if you'll just use the microphone, please. Right. Thank you, sir. I guess, Hans, I should probably just hand you all the Elko High School ones at the same time, right? Yeah. Ooh. All right. Um, so we had a really special year, uh, Elko High School track and field. Uh, our girls team finished first at region and first at state, so state champions. Uh, first time th since uh, 2012. And then our boys were runner up at region. We had individual state champions as well. Um, so we want to recognize first our girls, uh, members of that state championship team. Uh, first, we want to recognize Tyra Christine, who is also a state champion individually in the 200, no, the, the 300 meter hurdle. And she was runner up in the 200 meter dash. Oh. Ira, go ahead and come across and we'll shake your okay. hand. <laughs> First one gets to figure it out. So uh, next we want to recognize Abby Ramirez, uh, who is state champion in the 800 meter and was part of the four by 800 meter relay. It was also state champion and set the state record, or the, not the state, the school record. I'm pumping you guys up. And next, we want to recognize Liliana Haynes, who was part of that four by 800 meter relay state championship group and the state championship team. Reese Hatch was also part of the four by 800 meter relay. Carly Nielsen was as well. Oh, Carly. She also took second in the uh, the ladies two mile at state. 
Uh, Shirley Huckins, uh, we'd like to recognize her. She competed in both the shot and the discus at state. <clears throat> Sasha Vera uh, competed in the girls four by 400 meter relay at state. So did Jess Guevara. And then Elvia uh, Jimenez Lozano, Lozano Jimenez. Um, I don't have a certificate here for Braylon Baggy, but he was also state. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Braylon Baggett was the state champion in the two mile race on the boys' side. And then we did have uh, two managers that helped us out throughout the year. That was Jacob Aguirre and Anika Haro. There, but proud of our group and thank you for having us here today. All right, I'll come back down to the microphone so that we can hear the next group, but congratulations, Elko High girls and Braylon also. Um, great job. It was fun. It was fun to watch you guys run and uh, I'm sure we get to see a few of you after this year as well. So congratulations again. All right, one more round of applause for them. All right, and, and when you are done, we would like you to go out in the hall and um, Kayla will take your picture. So, all right, we will now move to Spring Creek High School um, and we will go with track first. Oh, hold on, I may have, okay. Coach, you coming up? Hold on, Coach, I got a couple more here that we had to, okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, our boys were uh, runners up at state and regional champions. Um, and then the girls um, were fourth, but we have a lot of individual um, uh, champions here. So uh, we have Nathan Morrill, he was the 800 meter state runner up. And then uh, Nathan Morrill, also a four by eight relay state champ. Joel Herman, who was a 1,600-meter state runner-up and four-by-eight four by relay state champ. Do you want me to skip over the ones that aren't here? Say the ones, say the ones that aren't here, too. Just Oh, okay. Yeah, so I'll Liam see. Hamilton, also part of the four-by-eight relay state champion team, and Nathan Thomas. Uh, Jonathan Crawford Wadley was the state champion for high jump um, and very close to breaking the school record. Austin Riesbeck, uh, four by one relay state runner up. Michael Durame, four by one relay state runner up. Uh, Michael Durame, um, champ, state champion for triple jump and broke the school record. Um, Christian Durame, four by one relay state runner up. Uh, Chase Valtiera, four by one relay state runner up. Um, Taryn Metz, pole vault state champion and broke the school record. And then we have Jake Bradford, a uh, pole vault state runner up. We have Ella Bazzetti. She's a shot put state champion. Kylie Munson, a 800 meter state runner up and 1600 meter state champion and 3,200 meter state champion. Okay. All right. 
and congratulations again, Spring Creek High School. So it was awesome to watch you guys compete. Some of you have been watching you for, for a lot of years and we're gonna miss you next year. So anyway, one more round of applause and then we'll go on from there. All right, we are now going to move on to Spring Creek High School baseball. And coach, if you wanna come up, we don't have we don't have certificates because we did not get the list yet, but I'm going to have you just go ahead and announce your boys that are here. And they were the academic state champions for baseball. So you'll go ahead and announce them. All right. Uh, Aiden Harp. Matthew Lloyd. Trevor Hampton. Logan Lopez, Caleb Cope, Dylan Ingebretson, Slade Jones, Riley Smith, David Hutchison, Chase Merritt, and Wyatt Sandoval. Good job, Coach. <laughs> All right, well, again, congratulations. Way to go, guys. We love to see some academic state champions, and I know you also had an incredibly successful season playing baseball too. Both are pretty fantastic. So congratulations again, another round for them. All right. Okay. We also have certificates for West Wendover. I'm not sure if we got anybody from West Wendover here, but we will announce those. Um, for West Wendover High School, uh, Adara Griffith was the um, long jump state champion. From Carlin, we had Jaden Lofton, who was the long jump. And for Jackpot, we had Jose Avia Fragosa, um, was the 800-meter uh, champion. And the 1,600-meter champion. And the 4 by 8 relay runner-up. Hold on, my certificates are sticking together. Um, Alfredo uh, Aguilar was on the four by eight. Um, Martinez was on the four by eight and Ray Perez was on the four by eight as well. All right, and I actually have a stack that was needs to go out to the Elko High School girls. All of them got announced, but I think these are the... Uh, the individual ones that they also announced. So congratulations to our spring athletes. I know we had some other students that were also in, recognized individually as academic um, regional champions and academic all state. And so what a fantastic season. Love to see our student athletes succeed and have such a great, great time. All right, we will move on to item 1.6, which is receive a presentation from the Sage Kindness Club. Okay. Okay. Let's get those all together. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening and thanks for having us. I am Caitlin Jordan and I am the fourth grade teacher at Sage Elementary. I decided to create a kindness crew at Sage to get students involved with spreading kindness around our school. Our mission is to share kindness with everyone. We do this not for recognition, but because our students, teachers, community, and world deserve more kindness. I'd first like to introduce our members and to thank those who have been a big help. Some have joined us tonight and some couldn't make it, but a heartfelt shout out and thank you to all. We have Ms. Josie Warwick, fifth grade teacher, special teachers, um, special teachers, Heather Wines Art, Diane Sen Music, and Tana Hendrickson PE, and of course our principal, Jessica Harris. 
Our fifth grade students were Jaden, Kenzie, Sammy, Kennedy, Damon, and Peyton. Our fourth grade students, Antonio, Blazin, Miles, Damon, Owen, Carly, Mackenzie, Alton, Kiana, Joanna, Anna, and Macy. And our third grade students, Maylee, Emerson, Aria, Taryn, Nicholas, and Rustin. So now I'd like to turn it over to members of the Kindness Crew to present some of the things that we did this year. As they're coming up, Kindness Crew that's kind of in the back, you guys can come up to the front. <laughs> so so you can we can see you too. <laughs> The Kindness Crew made signs welcoming kids to school. We stood outside and welcomed people. The whole reason we did this was to make everyone happy before school. It made us feel great to welcome people and make them feel great. Welcoming kids to Sage made them feel happy. We would stand outside or in the halls and cheer as students walked in. We would hold the doors and greet people inside. We would also play music and dance to greet parents, students, and teachers. I don't know what to say. A oh. uh, kindness crew made gifts for students during holidays. For Christmas, we made ornaments with glitter inside and a kind message on the outside. During the week before Christmas break, we randomly pulled names of students to give ornaments to when they were announced at the office. We also made Valentine word searches for every student at Sage. We attached a crayon to them and passed them out on Valentine's Day. The students were very happy the day we passed them out. It made us feel good to give students gifts and surprises. One of the charities we donated to this year was uh, Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation. That foundation raised raises money for childhood cancer awareness. We sold cups of lemonade at lunchtime to the students and staff for $1. All the money we raised was donated to this foundation to help research childhood cancer. We were able to raise $400 in two days. This was a great fundraiser to be part of, of and it made it it made us feel good to help other kids. Um we love to and we love and appreciate our teachers. We created a snack cart with chips, cookies, soda, water, and more to give out to teachers and staff. Kindness Clue member, members would walk around before school, starting to ask teachers, secretaries, janitors, and substitute teachers and any other adult that would like a treat for the day. We wanted to show them our appreciation for how well hard they work for us every day. One way that we raised money to be able to do some of the events, what events at, was by selling jerky sticks. We sold them when we would have our welcoming days. The money we raised helped us pay for some of the supplies for lemonade sales, gifts, and snacks. It was a nice treat for, for students and teachers who like jerky. Thank you again for allowing us to present to you tonight. A heartfelt thanks goes out to school board members, central office staff, teachers, community members, parents and students for all of your hard work. We couldn't do these things without all of your support. Sage Kindness Crew appreciates you. We hope we've shared some kindness with you and brought a smile to your face tonight. We have gifts for school board members tonight that we are going to pass out. Thank you.
All right, kindness crew, can you come across the front and give us all a five? <laughs> nice job, guys. Nice job. Nice job, guys. <laughs> Awesome. Well, how about another round of applause for our kindness crew? That's All right, as, as, as the kindness crew is leaving, we just can always be reminded to be a little more kind. I love that. That's fantastic. What a great club. And thank you parents for having such great kids and having to be part of the kindness crew. All right, we will move on to item 1.7, recognition of Jordan Montez as the Nevada Association of Student Council Advisor of the Year. And I get to do this one. Um, student councils have a, um, student councils and student council advisors have a special place in my heart because I used to be one. Any good memory or great memory you guys had of high school, whatever activity it was, um, was done by the student council uh, advisor. They play an absolute super duper, I can't even think, the most important role you can as a, as a super duper, for the record, super duper <laughs> uh, role for any uh, successful high school. Uh, any principal will tell you that with a good student council advisor, it's basically having a, another uh, effective administrator on staff. Um, this year uh, at the state association of student councils every year they, at their uh, conference, they pick uh, an advisor of the year. And this year it happens to be Jordan Montes, who is the student council advisor at Elko High School. Um, this is very important because we don't have very many of these that come to our district. And it's uh, out of every single high school in the entire state, everybody else is, you get coaches awards for, for the individual league, but uh, Jordan beat everybody regardless of uh, what it, uh, what league they're in. And when I say beat, she doesn't get to nominate herself. This is outside nominations from her colleagues or, or peers, and uh, most importantly, her, probably her students. So uh, Jordan Montes, come on up. No. Okay. Well, she, she's got a plaque. We've already done taking uh, the pictures in the hallway. So we'll just shake hands with those that want a bit. Well, and congratulations, congratulations, Jordan. <laughs> You'll see her at everything because she's in charge of everything. So once again, thanks to Jordan, more commonly known as Jojo. Well, thanks, Jordan, for being an awesome student council advisor. That's fantastic to be recognized. We're glad to have you here. All right, we'll move on to item 1.6, recognition of the Be Glad program certific certification recipients. Sorry. 1.8. Sorry. I'm, I need to move well, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity. Appreciate that. We, um, my teachers may not be champions for running, but they are champions in the classroom. <laughs> so we're here to celebrate that. Um, so um, they did a program called Be Glad, which is a uh, language acquisition and literacy program. Um, and it's about 42 hours of training that they do. And we wanted to promote this more in our school district. So that's one of the reasons why I asked Mr. Anderson if we could actually present it at the board meeting. So um, maybe other teachers would wanna do it. Um, so what is Be Glad? It's a guided language acquisition design in a student center, uh, fosters a sense of identity and voice for students. It has high expectations and standards. It's a thematic um, type of instruction. 
Um, it's been field tested for nine years before it was done and approved by the US Department of Ed. Um, there's lots of dat data behind this program about student success and improvement, um, increased retention, comprehension, and test scores um, if it's employed in the classroom. So last year we had eight teachers that completed the training and this is my second year here at ELCO. But um, so we um, had eight teachers that completed and this year we had 10. So we keep improving and the more teachers we can get to complete this program, the of course, the better for our students because it's not just for ELs. It's not for English language learners. It's for every school, they, uh, every, every um, student. Anyway, so I wanted to congratulate them. They are officially a Be Glad teacher and I will present the certificates and then you guys can congratulate them. That's, that's a lot of work to do when you have a full-time job and other responsibilities in life going on and you might be a parent and everything else, right? So Susan Collins. Congratulations. Cindy de Leon. Um, okay, I got to see because some people are not here. So Gladys Nunez Flores. And Maria Elsa Spence. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yes. Thank you and congratulations on all that hard work. Thanks for taking care of our students. <laughs> all right, we'll move on to item 1.9. Receive a presentation from Division of Child and Family Services Social Services Manager, Brandy Holbrook. Good evening, board members and the superintendent. Thank you so much for allowing me to present today. My name is Brandi Holbrook, and I am the Social Service Manager for the Division of Child and Family Services here in Rural Region 1. That encompasses four rural counties. So my, I'm the manager over Elko County, White Pine County, Eureka County, and Lander County. And so I'm here tonight to talk to you about your most vulnerable po population. Oh, after all those presentations, I'm like, oh, they did so good. They're little kids and they get up here and talk like a breeze and I'm up here stuttering. Um, and so one of the things and why I'm here tonight, and I've been going across all four counties talking to the leaders of those communities because knowledge is power. And I believe as school board members, I mean, you guys promote that every single day in everything that you do. So I'm here tonight to give you some knowledge about your most vulnerable population that you serve, and those are the children who experience child abuse and neglect that must be removed from their home. There's a countywide issue, a statewide issue, and a nationwide issue. There are no homes. You're not alone in that, but currently in Elko County, if a child has to be removed from their home, there's nowhere for them to go. They do not get to remain in their community. They do not get to remain in their school, neighborhoods, or with their friends. So if a child had to be taken out and didn't have a family member or a fictive kin member who would step up, they're going to be displaced. And right now we don't have homes across the state. So it's went from a, a crisis to a state of emergency because it's not only before um, when I didn't have homes within my region, then I would find a home in Nye County or Humboldt County or another county. And though they were displaced from their communities, there was somewhere to go. Currently, and over the past four months, children have been going into motels. They've been staying in hotels in Reno, Carson City area, and staff from the Division of Child and Family Services has been stepping up and taking on a role that is not their job. They're not responsible to care for children through the night, but they also know that if they don't step up, those children who have already experienced child abuse and neglect are now homeless and have nowhere to go and no one else is stepping up. I do not have the answers. So again, I'm not asking you to have the answers. I started this by saying knowledge is power. And I think that as leaders 
and community members. If we don't have the knowledge, we can't do anything. So that's why I'm here, to give you knowledge so that you can do with it what you choose. Um, there's a need for community leaders and stakeholders to partner and to collaborate and to really think about and brainstorm what can be done because something has to happen. This is unacceptable for these children. <clears throat> they need to be allowed to remain in their schools where they've been safe and secure. They need to stay in their communities. More importantly, we work very hard to try to keep them in their homes. And so in that, there's a need for emergency shelter care. That's a place where they can go in the middle of the night, where they can have a bed, food, shower, and someone just to provide for that until other arrangements can be made. <clears throat> There's a need for advanced foster care. Many of the kids that are coming into care that haven't historically been able to stay here is because they have needs due to trauma and other experiences, and there isn't advanced foster care homes in, in Elko County. There's none in the rural region at this time. Um, and so we need, we need advanced foster care homes. We also need transitional living for the 16, 18 year olds. I don't know if you guys have teenagers, but at that age, they're trying to become independent anyway. So the last thing they want me to do is to remove them from their home and find them a new mom and dad. So they tend to run away. They don't show up for school, especially if I place them in Pahrump, Clark County, or another community. <clears throat> There's a need for Nevada stakeholders and community leaders to come together and brainstorm and support and have a goal to avoid the removals from the home about what community-based services are needed in your county. So that includes like Carlin, Jackpot, Wells, West Windover. So currently for Elko County, you have homes in Spring Creek and Elko County, but they're full or in Elko. So your outlying communities that I just listed have no homes so they're not even full. You have 41 children currently today who are in foster care and only nine of them are remaining in your county at this time. I've been going around talking to all the government bodies. So I, I encourage you to get with, with your commissioners, with your city council members, because I've been to, been to all of those places in Elko County to also brainstorm on what needs to happen and where does this need to go. The state should be collaborating with you, our agency, um, legislators to figure out what are we going to do for this population. So that's what you can do is take this knowledge and share it. Um, encourage people to, to step up if they've thought about being a foster parent before or even emergency shelter care, which is very short term, three to 10 days just to keep a kid in the community until other arrangements could be made. Um, then that's what you can do is you can continue to educate because I don't know how many people before tonight, how many of you knew that you had homeless children that actually had nowhere to go if they were being displaced or kids staying in hotels? So most of the people don't know. So I think it's about spreading that knowledge. So that's my presentation. I do have flyers, um, FAQs about a lot of questions people ask about being a foster parent. And we do have a training coming up in July. It's online, everything is online. So people apply online, they take the training online, they don't have to go anywhere for that. So we've tried to make it as easy as possible. So again, thank you so much for allowing me to present. Thank you, Brandy. All right, we'll move on to item 1.10, recognition of our April and May STARS recipients. 1. what? Uh, 1.10. <laughs> all right. Um, so we've got uh, a bunch of these to read. Um, so we're doing both April and May's uh, STARS recognitions at this meeting um, just because of the, the way the last meetings all kind of shook out their location, that sort of thing. So I'm going to go back to April 1st. Uh, well, not the 1st of April, but First, I'm going to go to April, and uh, our um, our classified personnel. Uh, so this was a twofer, actually. There was a a pair of um, classified personnel that are so intertwined uh, in what they do and how important they are to the school that they were nominated together. 
And uh, those uh, ladies are named Argelia Brown and Fabiola Gonzalez, and they are the attendance and behavior secretaries at Oco High School. Catherine's familiar with them. They're pretty great, huh? Yeah, yeah, they're pretty awesome. So uh, their nominator uh, wished to remain anonymous, and I'm gonna read what said. When you walk into or call EHS, you see or hear one of these two ladies, then you uh, gain an understanding of how knowledgeable and helpful they are every day. They are two of the most dedicated employees here at Elko High School. They are here at 6.30 a.m. and don't go home until 3.30 p.m. every day. If either one isn't here, it must be for a very good reason. They are very supportive of one another, and that's why I felt it important to nominate them both because they truly do work as a team. They complement each other so well. Our students, parents, teachers, and administrators all communicate with these two on a daily basis, making sure you get to speak with the right person or get the correct information you are needing. They always maintain a great and positive demeanor, even through the most challenging times. They treat our learning community as equals. They don't get upset, and if they do, they keep it to themselves or amongst one another. It might be a cliche, but they truly are two pillars of Elko High School. They come to work every day ready to support our students and staff. They're terrific listeners and fabulous communicators. Our school runs smoothly because of these two. So congrats to Argelia and Fabiola. A lot of stuff over here today. All right. Um, and then uh, the next person is with us. Gayla, why don't you come, come on up here? Yeah. Gayla loves attention. Come on up. Come on up. <laughs> so um, I'm going to... Uh, Gayla was nominated by three different people. Um, and it's a couple of pages of stuff. So... I'm, I'm going to read you that stuff, and we're going to hear about how great Gayla is, and uh, and yeah, so I'll read first. Okay, so uh, she was nominated by the Dickinson family, uh, both parent and students. Some of you are familiar with Tammy, um, and it, they said we would like to nominate Miss Farmer for her enthusiasm and commitment to her students. Sorry, let me back up. She's a kindergarten teacher at Northside Elementary School, if you didn't know that already, and an exceptional one at that. Um, Ms. Farmer has thrown herself into teaching starting at Carlin Elementary. She worked with her kiddos through many challenges, including school closures due to COVID. She met these challenges head on and made sure the kids knew they were her first priority. She has since moved to Northside where she has continued to be a champion for some of our littlest students. Not only is she devoted to her classroom, but she serves on the PTA and is one of the founding coaches of the Northside Robotics team. She puts her heart and soul into everything she does, and our district is better for it. She is loved by her students and is a valuable team player for her school. She is an ideal candidate for this award, and we hope you will consider her for it. She was also nominated by a community member named Amanda Parrish. Amanda said, Miss Farmer is an exceptional teacher because she goes above and beyond to teach more than what is required of her. She truly cares about every student and their families. Her students are very responsive and have fun while learning. She communicates and maintains relationships with her students' families far after the school year is over. She is dedicated to the PTA as well as the Robotics Club. She also promotes collaboration amongst the other teachers. She is a team player. And then we got what, and I don't know this for sure, but this might be our first uh, nomination from a, a different country for a STARS member, or STARS recipient, but this person's name is Dr. Raymond Lavertu. Uh, a community member, and uh, Raymond is, um, I think he would be proud of the word loquacious uh, for, for the way he wrote here, um, and Raymond said the following. <clears throat> I, I lost, by the way, the kindergartner's attention when I was reading this one. They, they zoned out there. <laughs> the attention span is not meant for this type of writing, but Josh, I'm going to keep an eye on you. Attention span, stay with me. It is a pleasure and a privilege for me to submit this nomination of Gayla Denise Farmer. I can't, Get your middle name in there. <laughs> Gayla Denise Farmer, a kindergarten teacher at Northside Elementary School for the Elko County School District Employee Recognition Stars Program. Although I am now a resident of England, I am from the United States. I have been acquainted with Gayla since she lived in Rhode Island before her return to the Southwest some years ago. Gayla has kept me apprised of her academic and professional progress. I am aware of the enthusiasm and professionalism that she brought to science outreach education for the New England Aquarium awesome aquarium, by the way, and to early childhood education in Rhode Island and of the success that she experienced in those positions. I was therefore immensely pleased to learn that Gayla had continued with her studies in elementary education and joined the faculty of Northside Elementary School in Elko. 
Gayla is now very effectively drawing on and applying her unique professional experience, college education, natural abilities, and strong sense of purpose on behalf of students at Northside Elementary School. She is helping them achieve a foundation that will benefit them throughout their education and their lives after school. In the process, I believe she is contributing to the community of Elko and beyond. I will address just two of the multiple areas in which Gayla works diligently with her students at a critical point in their education. Upon beginning her position in Elko, Gayla indicated to me with excitement that she had plans to establish a classroom book collection for her students, an intent that I think is suggestive of the critical importance that she places on literacy education, something we were all discussing earlier today. It is my understanding that Gayla teaches through the science of reading, gives great attention to phonics, and uses Hegarty to teach phonological awareness. However, I know that what has also contributed to exceptionally positive results in reading by her students are Gayla's personal qualities, the creativity, individualized attention, kindness, personal support, and enthusiasm with which she infuses and applies pedagogical methods. With Gayla as their teacher, students will fulfill individual potentials in reading while acquiring a justified sense of achievement. They will move forward with tools to succeed in further education and with the promise of becoming avid readers throughout adulthood. In addition, Gayla draws on her education and experience to introduce students to science and nature. As with reading education, her personal engaging enthusiasm is the most effective factor in conveying the excitement of scientific inquiry and discovery. Gayla creatively incorporates extended observational and interactive experiments into the kindergarten classroom experience. Exposure to science in kindergarten contributes to the development of conceptual thinking and offers a host of other benefits. Gala students are fortunate to have a teacher who has been committed to experiential science education for children for two decades. As I know she is aware, Carl Sagan, the prominent American astronomer and creator of Cosmos, famously traced his interest in science to when his parents brought him to visit the 1939 World's Fair and the World of Tomorrow when he was four years old. It is certainly feasible that there will be future scientists, engineers, and physicians whose interest in their respective fields will have had its origin in Gala's Elko Kindergarten classroom. Gala's teaching produces visible and measurable results However, she also excels in non-quantifiable areas, working tirelessly to establish a welcoming, inclusive, and secure space for learning. Her thoughtful, supportive, and individualized attention and encouragement provides all of her students with an opportunity to develop as individuals. Gayla is keenly aware of and sensitive to the numerous challenges that life in the 21st century presents for her children. I am confident that her unique empathy and patience contributes to an environment in which students experience personal growth and build confidence. Her personal example encourages cooperation, mutual respect, and tolerance. I believe strongly that Gayla's work and contribution as a teacher is deserving of the recognition and support offered by the Elko County School District Employee Recognition Stars Program. Thank you for your consideration on my application on her behalf. Congratulations, Gayla. One of these is for her, right, Susan? Okay, Gayla, come on over. And Gayla, go ahead. If you want to shake hands before you get to your award. <laughs> I think so. That's, that's uh, made by students and teachers in Spring Creek. Is that um, very Thank you for all so that was April. All right. For the month of May, we were able to recognize a couple other excellent individuals. Um, the first one we're gonna I'm gonna read about is Amy Romanos, and she is a paraprofessional in our special education department at Spring Creek High School. And she was nominated by a coworker of hers, Miss uh, Paula Highland Smith. And Paula said the following, Amy is an aide in the special education classroom at Spring Creek High School. She is a very dedicated employee who takes her position very seriously. She keeps a daily record of her duties and her assigned students activities. She's always willing to help other students that need assistance with work, even though this is not in her job description. She's friendly and a great assistant to her lead teacher. She willingly does additional duties for any department if her assigned person is not in attendance. She has a great bond with her student and keeps in constant contact with her parent. She has had a strong impact on her students' performance and behavior in school. She willingly assists the teachers on her students' schedule and performs tasks for them when she is present in their classrooms. She is strict yet loving with her assigned student and encourages her to work outside of her comfort zone. She has been a great asset to the special education program, and I am very happy to be working with her. Um, my favorite part about the Amy Romanos 
award delivery was uh, we got into the classroom and she's sitting in the back and the teacher's there. And I start to talk about the STARS program and she's just got this look on her face of like, well, mm -hmm. she's really excited for the teacher in the room to receive it. And then when, you know, we dropped the truth bomb that it's, it's her, she was just blown away. She couldn't believe it. Um, uh, you know, she probably thinks she doesn't deserve it. She's just doing her job and, and doing a great job of it. And so uh, all the students in the room, yeah, Amy, like it was, it was, it was a great experience. So congrats to Amy Romanos from Spring Creek High School. Last but not least um, is Barbara Peet, also a special education employee. She is a teacher in special education out at Owyhee Combined Schools. We went out for a drive to Owyhee to deliver this award to Miss Peet. And she was equally blown away and just uh, beside herself with, with uh, you know, emotion. Um, so uh, she was nominated by a fellow employee, uh, Miss Deborah Schaefer, uh, who was a, another teacher out there. And uh, she said the following about Miss Pete. I am pleased to announce, or sorry, to nominate Barbara Pete's exceptional contribution to Hawaii Combined School and Elko County School District. I would like to commend her for her dedication, commitment, and excellence. Barbara Pete's commitment to teaching and learning is admirable. Her willingness to assist all teaching staff and subbing and administrative positions when needed showcases her professionalism and dedication to the success of all students. Her work in inspiring a love of learning in her students through environmental science projects, science fair, and ACEs is remarkable and is a testament to her passion for teaching and the betterment of her students. It is evident that her work has not gone unnoticed as she is highly regarded by parents, students, and colleagues as a model of excellence in her position within the school district. Her consistent participation in leadership roles over the years and her ability to find effective solutions to problems at all levels of the school demonstrate her commitment to the success of our school as a whole. Barbara's kindness, listening ear, and consistent checking in on the welfare of colleagues demonstrate her commitment to creating a positive and effective school environment. Her dedication to being a champion for students, schools, and the community is exemplary and serves as an inspiration to all educators. I congratulate Barbara Pete on her accomplishments and thank her for her invaluable contribution to the Elko County School District. I hope her outstanding work will inspire other teachers to follow in her footsteps and continue to make a positive impact in their schools and communities. Congratulations to Barbara Pete. Well, congratulations to our April and May STARS recipients. Love to hear those. Don't, don't move on yet. Don't oh, move I'm on not moving on. Yet. Sorry, sorry. Okay. We're almost done. Um, so those were the four, and I just want to, because this was our last uh, month of STARS awards, I want to do one more thank you to, uh, to Total Eye Care, to an anonymous donor, to Keith Frain uh, with Maverick Gaming, to Leanne's Floral and Design, um, and to uh, Evergreen as well. Uh, they helped out in the month of March with our flowers. Um, we were able to uh, present all of the recipients all throughout the year with, um, with gift cards to Amazon, with Starbucks gift cards uh, or, or certificates, um, with flowers, with a, a nice framed uh, certificate. And, um, and it was just, it was always a pleasant, a thing to be able to do for them. And we couldn't have done that without the generous donations, um, whether it was financially or flowers um, for those people. So really appreciate that. We look forward to carrying this program out into the, the, the next school year. And we'll remind everyone then, but I wanna say it again now, um, uh, we nominations can come from anyone. They can come from parents, from students, from uh, staff members, from, university professors who live in England, like they can come from literally anywhere and to anyone at any school. Uh, we drove out to Owyhee, we drove out to Wendover, we went out to Wells, we went out to like, we, we went all over the district, wherever we were able to get nominations from, we recognize those people. And so uh, just encourage everyone to nominate and we'll make sure to, to pitch that again as we go into the next school year. But um, thank you very much also to Susan Neal for kind of heading this up and working with the committee and organizing everything and uh, and not reporting me to the police for my driving on all of our uh, trips out everywhere. <laughs> all right, well, thank you, Susan and your committee, and thank you to all the sponsors that make that possible. Um, and again, congratulations to all of our STARS recipients throughout the year. All right, we will move on to input from the public. This is a period devoted to comments by the general public, if any. 
in the interest of privacy and due process, the public is requested to not raise personnel issues except in a legally noticed closed personnel session of the board. Comments are limited to three consecutive minutes. A speaker's time may not be reserved, divided, apportioned, or deferred. No action may be taken upon a matter raised under this item of the agenda until the matter itself has been included specifically on an agenda as an item upon which action will be taken. Is there anyone who wishes to make a comment? Seeing none, we will move on to item 2.1, receipt, review, and possible approval of our final budget for FY23-24 school year. Uh, while Julie makes her way, I will intro the rock star, Julie Davis, our CFO, who has been, I think she slept like once a week over the last month or so. Um, so uh, she's got a presentation to, to talk about what's in our budget. And um, as I've mentioned before, and, and she's mentioned, things are still ever changing, even as frequently as last night, um, as legislation works its way out. But we move forward with the information we have, as long as that is the information we have. And and so take it away, Julie. Okay. Thank you. So in the last presentations, we've had this budget process uh, flow chart. So we're on the second cube now. Um, the next step will be that July 1 is the start of our fiscal year. And then we'll have a December adjustment for our audited ending fund balance. And then in by June 30, we can do another adjustment um, to move. You can't change and budgeted fund balance, but you can move if um, salaries was more than you expected, but supplies was less, you can move within uh, already budgeted totals. Okay, major changes from the tentative budget. So we updated for FY23 ending fund balance. Um, it decreased $2,080,000. The textbook purchase um, was originally budgeted at a million, and I think that came in around 2.4. Um, in lieu of transportation payments, we're above. Um, originally budgeted as those increased with a change in policy um, and just an updated um, with another month of seeing spending patterns, we updated our actual expected ending fund balance. Another change that we made in the last week was um, Friday lunch service. So, if meals are meals will be provided on Fridays at certain locations, any meals not eligible to be refunded by USDA will need to be covered by the general fund or any other allowable funds and at risk will be able to cover about 500,000 in expenditures for anticipated expenses that won't be covered by USDA. And that would be the meals, the labor to prepare the meals and the overtime for staff to provide the instructional enrichment on Fridays. And another change is decreasing regular programs in the general fund that decreased by about a million dollars. Chromebook purchases, um, don't need budgeted for in 24 as that'll be covered in a grant. Reallocated um, Part A budgets, which is the instructional budget allocated to the schools and moved some of that allocation to their Part B. Um, based on year end spending patterns, the schools for the last two years have had extra budget in their Part A, but not enough in their Part B. So I shifted some of that around to help out with that. Okay, so this is an updated chart to reflect the final budget versus tentative. The decrease in expenditures in 2021 was related to COVID um, grants covering expenditures. 
The increase in 2023 was partially due to the Chromebook purchase to maintain the one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, we had also purchased 10 buses and um, textbook purchases as well. Okay, ending fund balance. So when this was originally prepared, um, we hadn't, just this morning, we heard about confirmation that the SPED is supposed to be funded. So that'll put us closer to the number that's circled, um, which is still a decrease, which we'll get to in a minute, um, but it's a much, it's less of a slope than the prior years, which is a good thing. With the three years of declining fund balance, even with um, the anticipated SPED revenue, that requires a corrective action plan to be filed with the state per NRS. And since budgeted fund balance is less than 4%, that required the disclosure in the budget. And that's on page 15 of the budget PDF. Um, as of today, the tentative governor's budget um, shows about 5 million in SPED revenues. So I made a note on the presentation for that. Um, it's final once NDE has that amount in our amounts for the next two years. Hopefully we'll get that next month. Okay, so for the declining fund balance, that requires a corrective action plan. As the finance director, I do not set priorities for the betterment of the district, nor do I approve hiring. It's a joint effort amongst administrators who manage their respective department resources. I am, however, available to answer questions and make recommendations. In keeping with ethical business practices in publicly funded entity, it is in the board's best interest to formally request a letter from Superintendent Anderson detail detailing the plan of action that will be taken in order to balance the budget effective immediately. The letter should be public in nature, viewable by the community and constituents. Um, as responsible stewards of district's financial resources, it is imperative that we approach this situation with the utmost transparency and accountability. Given the collaborative nature of managing department resources, the involvement of both the superintendent and the directors is crucial in developing a plan that is not only addressing the budget shortfall, but also takes into account the impact on our educational programs. So that's a recommended, required by NRS step that we file a corrective action plan with the state. Um, required disclosure so everybody's aware. Um, if the fund balance continues to decline to the point where fund balance is too low to meet our obligations, mainly payroll and insurance, um, keep in mind insurance has been advanced about $2 million. So when fund balance goes below that, you can no longer pay your health insurance claims. So if that happens, the state takes over the district. So we don't want that, we want to address this through the corrective action plan before it gets to that point. The updated revenues that we're hoping to get next month should help. We still want to address the continuing declining fund balance because that's only sustainable for so long. Um, this is just a comparison of revenues as of the time I prepared the final budget. Um, I'll give an updated chart after we get updated numbers from NDE. 
expense comparison. So I wanna point out that PERS required expense on all benefited payroll is increasing from 29.75% of wages to 33.5% of wages. So this looks like a 3.75% increase, but that's as a percent of wages and actually a 12.61% increase in the PERS benefit expenditure incurred by the district. The estimated total cost of this increase is about $2 million. The total cost of the PERS benefit for the district is estimated at about $20 million. Health insurance benefits estimated to total over 14 million district-wide. And we'll get more detail into expenses in some future slides. Okay, so this is for the general fund. Um, I broke down what made up the expenditures to give more of an idea. Wages and benefits, 76.1%. Um, priority one expenditures, which include electricity, fuel, utility bills, insurance, things that you have to pay to keep the schools open. Um, almost 10 million. Um, so those are priority expenses that need paid, but that doesn't mean you can't look at efficiencies um, to help with those expenses. Transfers to other funds, which is usually, that's a lot of payroll covered in other funds. Um, 7.7 .7 million vehicles, one, it totals 1.2 million or about 1% of the budget. Uh, we should, a resolution to commit fund balance to make buses a priority was passed a couple months ago. And that's because if we buy five buses a year, counting the 10 we bought this year, um, will be funded for five buses by 2028. So we're funded for transportation based on a prior four-year average. At the moment, there were no bus purchases in that four-year average. So it's gonna take some bus purchases for a few years to get to that point. But after that, that million frees up and can then be used by the general fund for other, other expenditures. The remaining expenditures total 7.5% of the general fund expenditures or 8.6 million. And in a couple slides, we'll go over details in that. So this breaks out the, the priority one expenditures Health insurance, in addition to the premiums that come out through payroll, is the largest one, followed by electricity, property insurance, liability, which property, liability, there's a whole lot of stuff covered in that line. Um, SRO costs, natural gas, water. This details the transfers outline that was on um, the last couple slides. So it breaks out what transfers the general fund has, which is special education, um, federal grants, that's the match portion. Some grants say, we'll give you this grant, but you have to cover a percentage of the expenditures. So that transfer is to cover that. Um, gifted and talented, uh, we expect to need a transfer and E-rate. We have that budgeted now. Um, that's one of the fundings where we cover a portion of their grant. They cover 80, 90% of the project and then we cover the rest. So that's the transfer for that. Um, change from the tentative. So tentative budget in our fund transfers from the general fund was 9.2 million. Um, special services transfer decreased 1.3 million. 
Um, and then I have detail on the bottom of that page going over. Um, it looks like that's a big cut to SPED, but they're still 2 million higher than the prior years um, in funding. Um, the food service is no longer a transfer out from the general fund. That fund is expected to pretty much break even. However, they're going to need a transfer from the at-risk fund to cover Friday meals that aren't eligible for USDA reimbursement. Okay. And then this breaks out the other expenditures that we saw in the, the total expenditure breakout. Um, so largest one, supplies, web-based programs, services, uh, repairs and maintenance. This is only items over 100,000. The list would be really long if I, I did them all. So I just picked out the big ones. Um, the change on this page is, I guess I had, um, I didn't have the augmented assessed value from the state. So Department of Taxation sent that over and we updated the assessed values. Um, I wanna point out that the increase in FTE isn't really an increase. It's um, subs are kind of hard to count as FTE. So this is just filling those positions that the long-term subs are, are filling right now. And no change on this page because I used the last um, amount from Department of Education. And helping make this big 160 page thing a little easier to go through, I pulled out some of the important pages. So the new total, I have my Zoom thing on in the way. The new total fund resources is 192 million. The tentative budget was 195 million and we'll get into the changes in the next slides. This is page four of the big PDF budget. And that's hard to read, so we're gonna zoom in on the general fund. Final adjusted amounts um, for the budget. Regular programs totals 46% of expenditures, operations and maintenance 15%, school administration, uh, principals, uh, secretaries, their whole department to run the school. 7.5% of expenditures, transportation, 6.26%. Um, part of that is um, the increasing fuel costs and prioritizing the bus purchases due to our aging fleet and to help ensure funding by 2028. Student support, 5% of expenditures, central services, 3.5%. This isn't like just disclosure. There's a whole lot of, you know, I'm trying to summarize the big things, so I didn't list them all out, so it won't add up to 100%. Going over the changes from tentative to final. So we kind of already went over the decrease in Chromebooks. Uh, regular programs decreased 100%. Um, vocational, other programs decreased a little bit just due to uh, updated estimates. Co-curricular um, added 728,000 due to updated estimates. Since then, we've paid out some of the reimbursements to the schools. The decrease in interfund transfers that we went over on slide 11 and the decrease in ending fund balance of 228,000. And then that totals a decrease in column eight by 2,080,000. 
Okay, all the other funds. Total expenditures from tentative to final decreased 1.3 million. And that includes an increase of 14,000 to adult ed. Um, that's to reflect the updated revenue amounts for next year. So that fund breaks even. A decrease of 1.3 million to SPED. And I refer back to slide 11 for details on that. Um, E-rate of uh, the total project expenses are estimated at 563,000. And I decreased food service expenditures by 302,000 with updated um, estimates. And a formatting change from the tentative budget, the state requested that we don't use the less transfers row. So the amount flows down to the bottom. And this is the revenue page for the general fund. No change since tentative, because we're waiting for updated amounts from NDV. Um, this shows the change in beginning fund balance uh, from rolling from ending of 23 to 24. We kind of already went over that. Capital improvement, no change. Uh, this detail for project specific information will come after the capital improvement plan is completed. I think that's due August 1st. And then in the handout, which is also on board docs, I have links um, to ClearGov for information on projects that are, are going on now. Budgeted ending fund balance for the pay as you go fund as of June 30, 2024 is 8.7 million. Okay, a lot thrown at you in the last few minutes. So just reiteration, um, next steps, corrective action plan required by NRS for decreasing fund balance. Um, and then we're currently in the process of implementing a position control, which will also be worked into our corrective action plan. Um, this is a tool um, that we found for steps to cutting budgets. I've had questions on what are the steps and expenses to look at. I wanna reiterate, this is a for information use guide. This is not what the district has implemented. It's just um, for ideas. I can't keep saying we need to look at expenses and not provide <laughs> any information on how to do so. Any questions? Um, yeah, hi. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what does like the state board taking over mean for like students and teachers? So um, that would be a majority of impact would be here at Central. Okay. Um, they'd come in and take over management decisions. Um, they could make the decision to say, we're getting rid of management and starting over or we're taking over. Um, the intent of them coming in is to keep the schools running. So hopefully minimal impact to the students. Good question, thank you. When they take over, how long do they take over for until? Until they're satisfied that they can hand it back over. We wanna avoid that in the first place, <laughs> yes. pretty please. <laughs> Uh, that's what I was just going to say. We want to avoid that yes. part. <laughs> right, other, other questions for Julie? Um, on slide three, you mentioned a part A and a part B budget for schools. Yes. What does that mean? So part A is their instructional use that can be used for um, instructional material, 
supplies, services, uh, whatever they decide the classroom needs. Um, things that do not come out of the Part A budget that the district covers would be like the Xerox machines and utilities. So it's really whatever they decide that their school needs in their building and their teachers need. Part B is maintenance. Um, custodial supplies, any, pretty much anything they decide that their building needs. Um, we split those to ensure that they have custodial funds and maintenance funds and instructional. They're not supposed to make, like transfer between those two. And that's pretty much at um, principal discretion. All right, any other questions? Um, so the on slide five, it only shows like past to 2019. Um, so it shows like it goes down and then it goes up and then it goes steep down. Were the years before like COVID experiencing the same sort of decline that we see after COVID or is this a new problem? I could pull those, but I don't think we've been this low for a long time. Um, there were cash flows issues a few years ago, um, but that wasn't really a fund balance issue. It was more of a cash flow. The state um, didn't pay, the monthly payments from the state didn't keep up with expenses. And then they did a true up in August. So the problem with that year was the cash was received in August, but all the expenses were months before. So there have been cash flow issues before. Um, I think it's been a long time since we've had this many, I don't even think we've had three years of decline that I can remember. Something else to add to the context of that, Catherine and everyone else is uh, that was the time when they changed the funding plan for the state. The state had been working on something called the Nevada plan. Um, and then that money kind of got shuffled all around. And uh, as you saw on another slide, we are like the funding level is I think it said like 1.8% or something like that below what we were being funded in, in 2018. So our amount of funding that we got um, decreased after that change got made in the state funding plan. And then as was documented throughout, um, we also got like a surprise, haha, we're taking four and a half million dollars that you thought you were going to have as well. So uh, between just not getting as much money. And then in addition to that, having someone say, here's five more million, essentially you're not gonna get. Um, coupled with increased costs of everything from COVID, um, it's for me anyway, it's not hard to see why um, the money that we've been getting hasn't been keeping up with the expenditures that the schools have had to have. Yeah, the sweep of the net proceeds of mines in FY22 did accelerate the decreasing fund balance. So we have lots of board members up here shaking their heads and um, knowing that, you know, the, the way funding is distributed in the state of Nevada has changed. We knew that Elko County was going to get shorted when that happened. Um, it's not fun to see these numbers look the way they do. So, um, you know, our, our job as a board tonight, um, Julie gave us some recommendations, some things we have to do for NRS, and we also have to um, choose to potentially approve this budget. Um, it looks like Julie has done a lot to move things around, do the best she can with what we have. And um, moving forward, we're gonna have to make decisions as well as we can with what we've been, what we have been allotted and hope that the state sees they are not funding education adequately. And the districts who had money taken from them, like in the to the tune of four million dollars, 
in one chunk or just in general how they're funding. Um, I'm hoping the state can see we, we need to fund education in Nevada. But at the moment, we can't really change that. Um, we are not a legislative board. We, we set policy, we look over this, and we determine how we can move forward. So what is the pleasure of the board? Um, is mine on? I was just going to say um, her next steps, I think, are great to start on that corrective action plan right away and make sure that we get that filed with the state. And then she also has the recommendation of uh, position control formula to be applied prior to posting new positions for hire. I think that's a great idea. Um, Susan, Susan and I took a financial class, a school finance class through Georgetown University online. And I think it had a lot of good ideas that we learned in that class. And I've got all the paperwork and ideas and kind of um, workbooks and things at home that I can bring in. But it just talks about how um, whenever schools are spending money and whenever you're spending money as a school district, you just break it down so that if it's a program or something like that, you break it down to where you list what your objective is, what the goal is by implementing this program, what the cost is, break that down to cost per student for that program. And then you always reevaluate, you know, at a certain time later down the road to see, is this, is this providing the benefit that we wanted um, in order to have that program? So I think that that could be um, something that's implemented or looked, looked into just to make sure that when we're spending money that we're kind of following up on, is it providing the, the outcome? I, I can't even think of the word, but is it, is it providing the benefit that we wanted? So, um, and just kind of put those things in place because you're right, we can't really do anything about it now. So um, in the meantime, those are things that we can do to just make sure that the money that we are spending is providing a benefit to the kids and that it lines up with our uh, district the new strategic plan, those goals in that plan, make sure that our money is going to the right places. Mine's more of a remark than a question or anything, but just seeing this progress over the last couple of years has been extremely frustrating, seeing how the money's been treated by the state and then seeing things go up, like just referring to textbooks. Uh, we had to spend $2 million to get what we thought would be one. And I just continue to see those things going forward. And uh, I'm on cuts wise. Is that, I mean, really where we're going to have to start too? Are we talking salaries or is it, we're going to have to say no to books next year? Or I, how, how bad as no. far are we in here? Well, we budgeted 400,000 for books next year. We do a cheaper curriculum and not the 200 million right back to back. That'll help. And then once our transportation is funded, that frees up another million. Um, and it looks like we might be getting better revenue amounts, but I'm waiting for NDE to confirm them, but that'd be another 3 million. So that's why like, um, I had to budget based on NDE, which is the 1 million ending fund balance, um, but on slide five, um, I feel a lot better about it's still a decrease and we can't keep that forever. We should, we want to build ideally the fund balance up to about 12%. Um, but a decrease of less than a million um, in one year is a much better pattern than we've seen like from 21 to 22. That was a scary decrease, but it looks like we're leveling a little back out. So Really, we need to be up around 14, 15 million is what we're, we're trying to be at. But yeah. Yeah, I just don't see it with. We won't get there in one year. No, but even just seeing final budget on the front of this is kind of like, no, it isn't. Well, <laughs> it's the law that Until we know. It, I, it's I, the I, law yeah. that it's due. Like we, we can't always say, well, we don't know yet because people are going to need their new budgets starting July 1. So we need to do the best we can to plan. I'd rather plan with a lower budget and then add in the December augment 
then try to take back what we budgeted and say, oh, we didn't actually get that amount. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather be prepared for a lower fund balance and have a happy, oh, look, we're, we were funded more and it's better than the other way around. Like, oh, we thought we had two years of cash and we don't. So the way I read this personally is that if we don't see some change in the next six months or so, next year is going to be a whole lot of hatchet. So next year with the changes in this budget, that put ending fund balance around 6 million and like assuming we NDE confirms the SPED revenue and the revenue going through legislation that would put the ending fund balance around the circled amount on slide five. But then it shows a decrease going into 2025 projected. Well, we don't even know what this year is going to look like. So, so um, I did, those are based on numbers provided in March by NDE and we'll get updated ones hopefully by end of June. Um, and that's assuming a slight, you know, a 5% increase, there's merit, there's, there's step increases, there's things go up, but that gives us a whole year to implement a corrective action plan that can help that FY25 projection. And, and that leads me to my next question too, is that if we were to approve this budget today, uh, we still have a year to prepare for any kind of that big warning in the front of mm -hmm. getting taken over. Yes. So, okay. Just yes. wanted to make sure we're not in danger of that like tomorrow. No, when I did the tentative budget, I was really worried about that, but we've, we got more reassurance today just seeing what's going through legislature. And we met on Wednesday to start corrective action discussions. And that's what led um, to the adjustments that we see. So fund balance did decrease, but total expenditures in 24 decreased. It's because of the beginning fund balance with textbooks and stuff. All right. Even if that stuff doesn't come through, I know there's some optimism on what the legislature's doing, but even if that doesn't come through, we're still safe for the through this year, though, with through, this budget. Through probably April, assuming that the one million is what we ending fund. So you're assuming the revenues that we were told about in March are our final and they don't give us an adjustment. Um, ending fund balance would be about a million June 30, 2023. But I wanna point out fund insurance is usually advanced 2 million. So it'd be closer. It might be June because we pay, there's expenses in July, August that get booked back to June because teachers earned it by June 30 school year. So yeah, probably June. I basically, I'm just looking for reassurance that if we do pass this budget today, that we're. Well, it's the law. We have to pass a budget by end of May. Right. And I'm not sure we can, I'm not sure we can do a whole district wide corrective action plan in a week. Like we've started, but I think all we can do is meet NRS, pass a budget based on information we have work on a corrective action plan and hopefully in the December augment, we see some improvement. So we can make the corrections there in December if we need to, to go forward. Yes. Around. Thank you. I'm thinking we just really need to buckle down and find every penny we can, whether it kind of looks good or not, because, and we need to do this for quite a long time because it's not just going to be for a year or two. We need to figure this out. And I'm with Ms. Ballard as far as, you know, thank you for finding things to start already. Because um, I had written down like new positions, even health insurance of asking people to pay for part of that. Um, travel was another one I had written down. Um, we need to just be really careful of what we do with everything. And like Brooke had said, in the end, does it benefit students? 
and that's how we can base whether we spend it or not. It's all right. Any other questions or thoughts? Um, I have two, like, sort of related, sort of unrelated questions. What is the Nevada plan? <laughs> Nevada plan was uh, the DSA. That was how the schools define, were defined DSA. So okay. that's right. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> um, distributive school account. So that was um, monthly funding from the state of Nevada. In addition to the district, we um, in addition to the funding from the state, we received um, our portion of property tax, DMV tax, uh, governmental sale, governmental. Tax. I think that's sales tax, local school support tax. Um, now all that goes to the state directly from the county to the state, and then they apportion it through the pupil centered funding plan. So that plan replaced the Nevada plan, um, also called um, DSA, distributive school account. Okay. And so how is the money? like redistributed so like do we not get all of like the taxes do they go to like it could and Clark yes and stuff? Yes. <laughs> yes so like net proceeds of mine <laughs> is a big one um in 21 that was four million dollars just for Elko County and now that goes to the state into a big pool the the school account education fund and then they have a formula based on enrollment um district size like per pupil um, and that's allocated to all the districts in the county um, based on their formula so ir irregardless of what the county itself pays in in taxes okay and say hypothetically the state did take over our school district um if they were the one who implemented the Nevada plan that caused most of our funding problems, how would they offer any solvency by like stepping in? Um, I think they'd look at more, they'd criticize expenditures, uh, which is why uh, I've been working with Cody on the position control. That'll show the state that we examined that. Um, it's, I'm not sure they will, say, oh, you weren't funded enough. They'll start with looking through expenses to make sure we were um, handling the funds appropriately. Oh, okay. And Catherine, we're gonna send you to the legislature <laughs> to talk so on behalf of talk students in the district. <laughs> that might be the best question asked by anyone up here ever. Um, yeah, they're, they're not gonna come in and admit fault and say, hey, sorry, we underfunded you. We're gonna fix this problem now. They're gonna, they're gonna point the finger uh, I would probably lose my job. Pretty much everybody at that table would probably lose their job and they'd start fresh because they think they know better, which is why we're in the situation in the first place. So it's our job to, to figure out how to, and, and I feel like we're well on our way to figuring it out. Um, but right now, until things are finalized, until we know what numbers are what, like Julie's doing a great job of um, relaying what happens if nothing changes today if, if there is no extra money from a legislative session if there is no like it, it i'm optimistic um if you're like wondering why i'm not like in a fetal position over here it's because we're we're doing a lot of work on our end we've it, in a short meeting we came up with a couple million dollars almost to move around with just some quick conversation and and that's without delving deep into position control and other things and and some of those things we we, we can't know until uh till retirements happen until people move and and, and, res and resignations occur so there, there's a lot of processes that'll take place between now and and uh and when we find out what the state's going to do from a legislation standpoint from when we start the next school year there's there's a lot of dominoes to fall and a lot of moves that are being made but we're we are actively working on it on pretty much daily basis. And Julie, you did say we sort of have confirmed from the state that we're going to get this Fed funding that they gave us a zero. It's for. in. Um, it's not from NDE yet, but it's in the governor's um, bill and legislature. Okay, so so we're hopeful that we will get this Fed funding and we will yes. have a zero in that column. Yeah. Okay. All right. Other questions. I'm just going to go ahead with it. We've got the information Thank we you. need. We've got to go over everything. We 
have bludgeoned Miss Julie with plenty of uh, questions. I'm just going to make a motion to approve uh, the budget, the final budget. All right. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? I have a question about the letter that she recommended. Did we put that in this motion? Does it have to be? Yeah, that was going to be my, I was going to comment the same. Um, so uh, some sort of, uh, this is a suggestion because that's what I do. Uh, I make recommendations to the board. Uh, so she she gave some other items to do. So uh, it I mean, I'm going to do those things anyway, but if you want to, if, if we're going to do those as official, like get it agendized for next meeting, that sort of thing, um, just include whatever actions, what other, whatever other actions um, that would be actions. relevant yeah. to the corrective action plan, or to, sorry, to the approved budget. So just, well, I don't have that list in front of me. <laughs> Can you repeat the wording? So just like gave? in general then? I really don't want to do that. But. It's right here. Can I do it? Oh, sorry. Oh, it was on here? Yeah, it's on here. It's on Slide 22 has it as well. Yep. And slide five. Next steps. It's in the it's pretty much the very back. It's the last page. Oh my gosh. There we go. And I would like to say, I really do think that we should, if I bring in that stuff, that we should implement something like that, or at least look into implementing something where when money is spent on certain things, and it wouldn't have to be on everything, but when money is spent on certain things, you can break it down to how much it costs per student, the number of students that it serves, the intended goal, and a date that you're going to go back and we like evaluate if it's actually giving the intended benefit or not so that we're not just spending money in places it's not actually benefiting students something that's one of those was a contract checklist i think i read it like at one of the meetings i actually have that with me today yeah This one doesn't, I'm missing the letter one. Are you talking about the, what the formal requirements? About corrective action plan, is that? Julie? Yeah. Like at the beginning, you um, recommended a letter. Formal letter from the superintendent. Okay. Uh, re formally request a letter from Superintendent Anderson detailing a plan of action that will be taken in order to balance the budget effective immediately. The letter should be public in nature, viewable, and um, to the community and constituents. What so, Julie said. <laughs> so we move to, to amend the motion to include um, the letter that Julie is recommending and all the recommendations was in that. Um, yeah. Because we've already kind of started on the position control, but I put it formally here okay. as a recommendation. So I just want to add that letter to the motion. Right. As well as the reporting and, and and do we want that as a formal amendment or would you just like to um, restate your original motion if the the maker of the I don't know second is okay with that. that I don't know how this brain can do that <laughs> <laughs> I just like a formal amendment to it a formal amendment okay so as just as a reminder if we make it a formal amendment we need a second on that. Um, Do we have a second? second? Okay, so we have a second. So we will first vote on the amendment and then we will vote on the motion as amended should the amendment pass. So good. That's All right. Okay. Any, any discussion on the amendment? So the amendment is to include all of Julie's recommended next steps. Those listed on this page, page 22, 22 yeah. as well as the um, letter that is recommended we request from superintendent anderson right okay any other discussion on the amendment all right all in favor of the amendment please say aye aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed nay okay chair votes aye and 
the original motion is amended to include, include all of those things. Any other discussion on the motion as amended? Uh, I actually did have one quick question. I apologize, but I wanted to ask also about there is a threat of veto over the budget, possibly July 1, and I wondered how that affects us, and does it affect this budget at all if the state were to somehow shut down because of that? I don't, I would defer to whatever this NDE sends us as revenues. Um, I can't imagine they would veto to the point they don't get sent anything to the schools. So we won't be the only one um, with the problem at that point. So I, I can't say what would happen. I thought education always had to be funded. Like it, no, like it wasn't a choice of to hold back on that. I must be wrong. It's something I had remembered because it's it was actually part of my NASB report coming up, but. Uh, it's out there now, but yeah, if they can't agree on certain things in the budget, he's threatened to veto and it's, uh, they have a super majority on one side, but not on the other. So it could hold up and, and there is a possibility that the state goes and doesn't write any checks until they figure that out. So mm -hmm. I just want to, I, my question would be if that would affect this budget at all. Um, I would hope that that's why we need adequate fund balance. So yes. that would last until they start cutting checks. And at sure. the moment we have that. So we want to keep that by the end of next year. All right. Thank you. All right. Any other discussion before we vote? All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Chair votes aye and the motion carries. Julie, thank you. All right. So as a reminder, everyone will need to sign this before you depart. And Julie, is there one page of just the front, right? Okay. All right. So before you leave, make sure you sign. All right. We will move on to item 2.2, receipt review and possible approval of Elko County School District School Site Administrators Association Collective Bargaining Agreement. This is for possible action. All right, Mr. Anderson, are you going to intro this one? I'm just going to discuss. Oh, sure. Um, so, our site administrators up to this point have had um, an association, but not a bargaining agreement. And we've been working pretty much, I guess this actually dates back to last school year. We kind of had conversations late last school year and uh, been working in a very nice manner one with another not involving any legal entities really just working together on finding a, a good bargaining agreement that that is specific to site administrators so um uh, up till now there's been like a weird combination of whatever the teachers association uh has kind of applies to them but then there's also policies that specifically apply to site so um they wanted to formalize a bargaining agreement and this is the product of our negotiations and creation of that bargaining agreement. All right, any discussion from the board? If not, how would you like to proceed? Move to approve the Elko County School District School Site Administrator Association Collective Bargaining Agreement. Thank you, do we have a second? Second. Is there any discussion? <laughs> I just want to say thank you uh, to all those parties involved. It sounds like it's moving along. It could be otherwise. So I appreciate it all the time that goes into this. All right. Any other discussion? All in favor of approval, please say aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Chair votes aye and the motion carries. Item 2.3 is our superintendent's evaluation discussion, discussion and possible action related there too. All right. So this is where, unlike most other jobs, we get to uh, evaluate our employee in public. And uh, I'm sure this is just Mr. Anderson or any superintendent's favorite time of year. All right, so um, unless the board would like to do it differently, we have the superintendent evaluation form and we can go through that um, 
each section. We'll start with um, relationship with the board, which is section A. There are five items under that one, five items under section B, and um, five items under section C, et cetera. Um, we can go through and if I could get someone to tally as we go along. Um, thank you. I say normally our clerk would do that, but he is not available this evening. And I do believe he sent his evaluation. So if you'll give me a minute. All right. So what we can do is while I'm loading Matt's evaluation, um, let's start on um, item on heading A, item one. And um, so item A is a relationship with the board. And the first number one is appears prepared for all meetings. So let's start with Susan and then just we're going to start at the end of the column and come backwards because I'm opening Matt's thing here. So, so go ahead, Susan. Four. Okay. Adriana. Five. Jeff. Five. Josh. Five. Brooke. Five. Matt gave him a five, and I would have a five also. Number two is keeps four. Okay. Sorry, I should let you know if there are specific things you want to talk about on any of these items, let's go ahead and do all of A at once. And then we can talk about that as a general statement, unless you really, really want to talk about item whatever number. So if you really want to, to mention something specific to an item, go ahead and let me know. Otherwise, we'll go through and do all the numbers first, and then we'll take comment for section A before we move on to section B. Is that all right with the board? Okay, all right, we will go to item two, keeps the board informed on issues, needs, and operations. Three. All right, okay, Susan? Three. Adriana? Five. Jeff? I got a four. Josh? Four. Brooke? Three. Matt gave a three, and I also gave a three. Item three is correctly interprets and executes board policy. Four. Adriana? Four. Jeff? Three. Josh? Four. Brooke? Four. Matt gave a four, and I gave a four on that one as well. Number four is seeks board input and is responsive to board members' concerns. Three. Susan? Three. Three. Adriana? Five. Jeff? Three. Josh? Four. Brooke? Three. Matt gave a three, and I have a four on that one. Item five is supports and correctly interprets board policy to staff, parents, public, and the media. Three. Adriana? Four. Jeff? Four. Josh? Four. Brooke? Hold on, let's go back. What was Adriana? <laughs> Adriana four? was a four. Four? four. A four. Okay. Jeff? Uh, it's a four. Five, right? four. Four. Okay. Josh? Four. Okay, sorry about that. It's all right. Good. Okay, Brooke. I'm a four. Matt was a four, and I'm also a four. All right, that is all of um, relationship with the board. Are there any comments? I just wrote up my comments for the end. Okay, that. and that's fine too. We can just do comments complete at the end if that is Perfect. how everybody would like to do as well. I just don't want to stifle anyone if you really have something you want to say. All right, we will go ahead and move on to, and we can tally these in a minute. So let's let's get them through, then we'll tally while we um, also provide comment. Okay, B is administration of the school district. Item one is works with staff to ensure the efficient operation of the district. Three. Adriana? Four. 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 Brooke? Four. Matt has a four, and I also have a four. Number two is response to issues in a timely manner. Susan? 
Three. Adriana? Four. Jeff? Five. Josh? Five. Brooke? Four. Matt has a do not, does not know, a DK. And on that one, I have a four. Number three is treats personnel with respect and impartiality. Susan? Three. Adriana? Five. Jeff? Four. Josh? Five. Brooke? Five. Matt has a DK, and I have a three. Number four is strives to maintain high morale and positive work atmosphere. Susan? Three. Adriana? Five. Jeff? Four. Josh? Five. Brooke? Four. Matt has a four, and I also have a four. Number five is develops and maintains a collaborative work environment, which promotes cohesion and cooperation among staff. Susan? Three. Four. Four. Josh? Four. Brooke? Four. Matt has a DK, and I have a three. All right, any comments, or do we want to move on to the next section? Okay, we'll move on to the next section, which is community relations. All right, item one is prompt and effective in addressing community concerns. Susan? Three. Four. Jeff? Four. 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 Matt has a DK, and I have a four. Number two is promotes the school district through the development of rapport with the media. Three. Four. Four. Uh, four, sorry. Brooke? Four. All right. Oh, hold on. My phone went off. I've got to oh, pause with the media. Sorry, Matt has a four, and I also have a four on that one. Okay. Number three is supports school activities through attendance at school sponsored events. Four. 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 Matt has a five. And I have seen Mr. Anderson at a lot of school events. So I am also going to give him a five because I do expect him to also spend time with his family. Mm -hmm. So I think he's doing a great job on that one. All right. Number four, supports community activities through active involvement in community affairs. Four. Five. Five. Four. Five. Matt has a five and I also have a five. Number five is facilitates opportunities for input and communication with other stakeholders in the school community. Three, four. I don't know. Okay. I am as well, actually. Brooke? I'm kind of same thing. I had numbers written on here, but I couldn't decide between them. I'm going to do a don't know also. Okay. Matt has a four, and I, I have also got a four on that one. From what I have seen, I think he does a good job of, of working on that one. Okay, we will move to um, D, which is educational leadership. Number one is uh, serves as a role model for professionalism. Three. Say five. I am a five. 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 Matt has a four and I have a five. Number two is works with administrators to improve their professional abilities and skills. Three, four. 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 Matt has a three and I have a four. N number three is visits schools on a regular basis. Four. Five. 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 Brooke? Wait, okay, so I missed someone's. Susan was a? Four. And then? Five. five. Adriana? Five. Jeff? Five. Josh. Five. five. Okay, four. Uh, Matt is a four, and I have got a five on that one. Number four is inspires others to highest professional standards. Three, four. Uh, four. 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 Matt has a four, and I've also got a four. Number five is encourages new ideas and approaches to promote student success. Three. Four. Three. Four. I'm a don't know. 
All right, Matt has a three and I have a four on that one. All right, so that gets us through all of the categories. Um, so we need to tally those up so we get our average and we are going to take an average. Um, we will not include Mr. Anderson's self-evaluation number in that average, um, but we will include all the board members. So we'll get an average on each of those. Um, it's being plugged in right now to the... Okay. I, I figured I figured Matt and Jeff would just have these in their head already. Can you tell I'm to not go. a multitasker, by the way? Anytime I would try to read something and still do it, well, <laughs> like going, missing stuff. Going backwards. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I, I apologize for going backwards, but I, I had to open Matt's thing he sent. So um, so that made it a little easier to, to get to his thing and not waste time. All right, so let's get the average for each um, for each item, and then we'll have an overall category average as well. And Brooke, if you have that on multiple pages, you could pass that down and the board could help you uh, if you'd like, or is I'm CJ getting it all? Okay. The spreadsheet. All right. We should have it. Doing his own data. All right. Yeah. Well, I, I would recommend we take a quick, like, six minute recess while he puts all those numbers in. Everybody get up, grab a drink, whatever you need to do. And, uh, oh, you're finished. Oh, okay. Never mind. I guess, would the board like to take a couple minutes or are we ready to just plow on? I'm ready for a break. Okay. Okay. It is 727 on my watch. Yeah. Sounds good. 733. Everybody be back. Six. Is that enough? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll wait till he gets back because I don't want to mess something up. Where are the only ones? I know. And
is having Emma as a teacher. No, but um, I love her. saying she's just the sweetest. She is. I get back up to the top. Oh, just I like touch. So, so let me just read that. You can read a couple of okay. Just as a reminder, um, while we had our break, all the mics were muted. So we will go ahead and reconvene because it is indeed 7.33. Are we ready to go numbers? We are. We okay. just double checked everything and it's all entered incorrectly. So he's got the averages. So okay. just from a formula standpoint for how the spreadsheet is set up, my self eval does not factor in. Um, it's just not part of the formula. Um, and then anything that is a DK also does not carry any weight. It just means if you don't know, then your number doesn't get factored in because you didn't give a number. Correct. So um, those that is how that all works. Uh, so I can, do you, you want me to read all the averages? How many decimal points would you like? All of them. Oh. Are you sure? <laughs> no. Because it just, goes just, to eight just, every time. Two, just like two, make you do two rounding well. up. Sure, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, rounding, it up. rounding up yeah. or down. Rounding appropriate, appropriately. As I learned in math class. There you go. Okay. Yeah. All right. So for A1 appears prepared for all meetings, 4.86. A2 keeps board informed, 3.57. Interpreting and executing policy 3.86. Seeks board A4 seeks board input 3.57. And A5 and supports incorrectly, etc. 3.86. And the category average is 3.94. Will you repeat what five was again, please? The number was 3.86. Yep, sure rounding. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Next, B, responsibilities, administration of the school district. B1, working with staff, 3.86. B2, responding to issues in a timely manner, 4.17. B3, treating personnel with respect, 4.17. B4, high morale, positive work atmosphere, 4.14. And B5, collaborative work environment, 3.67. Was the first one 3.86? Yes, yeah. it was. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
C, community relations. Uh, pause. Sorry. What was the category average? Oh, I apologize. Thank you. Uh, it was exactly a four. No decimal points. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Sorry, 4.00. Zero, zero. <laughs> <laughs> he just looked off my paper, by the way. <laughs> I did. I had, <laughs> what was that? All right. It's community relations. C1, prompt and effective in addressing concerns, 3.83. C2, promoting the school district with the media, 3.86. C3, supporting school activities through attendance at events, 4.26. Sorry, 2.9. I apologize, 4.29. C4, supporting community activities through active involvement in community affairs, 4.71. And C5, facilitating opportunities, 3.75. Category average, 4.09. D, educational leadership. D1, role model, 4.57. D2, working with administrators to improve. 3.71, D3, visiting schools, 4.57, D4, inspiring others, 3.86, and D5, encouraging new ideas and approaches, 3.5, category average, 4.04. .04. All right, we now have all those wonderful numbers in front of us. And um, we can now move to comments from the board in whatever manner you would like. If you'd like to break them down by category or just general comments, um, that is pleasure as you share your comments. All right, who would like to start? And I went okay. with... Um, Sorry, I just went with what the sheet said. So do you want me to do the two in the back or do we want to do one at a time? I'll just do them all. Just, yeah. just go ahead. Oh, so for it. greatest strengths or accomplishments, I had makes great efforts to attend schools, events, and community events. Um, you delegate to others. Uh, you worked with others to get the strategic plan developed and moving forward. And you make efforts to build partnerships with business government entities. And then for growth or increased attention, um, increased parent community, parent slash community involvement with ECSD. Keep trying until you find something that works in all of our communities. Um, remember that the board can be part of that as well and um, possibly form committees, uh, parent committees to help you with some of the issues that are happening. Um, then I put, um, Attention to student outcomes, as I didn't think much was mentioned specifically in your self-evaluation, but just um, how are you working with staff admin to support better student outcomes? Um, establish professional goals and deadlines as the new year, new year meaning school year, <laughs> approaches and share those with the board in public. And you probably will be doing that since the board has come up with some goals. Um, even like the ones you mentioned in your self-evaluation, um, maybe how are you working? How are you going to work towards those if you decide to stay with those? Um, and then the last one was just increase your attention on the budget where that money's being spent, how it impacts student achievement, where we can allocate money to be the most effective working with the board and the public. All right, who would like to go next? I'll jump in. Um, something that was mentioned earlier in uh, our workshop that I would think going forward to would be good because some of these were hard to uh, quantify just because I don't have the day-to-day uh, -day and personal relationships with a lot of like administration and things of that nature. And I had intended actually last week to come out and try and talk to some people and just life happens and 
and it is what it is, but uh, I would like going forward, possibly into the next year, to look and see if we can't uh, um, kind of put this on the, or, or make these a little more accessible. And I had one like C5 um, was hard for me. I had to put a don't know on because I honestly don't know. I, it's not something that, again, I'm a couple hours away in a different time zone to where I don't really have the opportunity to see those. And I didn't want to put anything high or low because I know you do things, but I, uh, those I don't. And that was kind of reflected in, though in the communication also. Um, but uh, as far as the, the questions that are asked of me, I really want to refer back to your self-evaluation. And I felt like that you were very open and honest with that. And I appreciated how you were with that. We didn't really get an opportunity to tell you that last week with you or last meeting with you walking down the street on the phone. So uh, it's, I've saved it for today, but uh, I would echo a lot of what you had said there, if not all of it uh, on your self-evaluation as to what I would put as recommendations going forward. But like I say, I would like to see um, a little better uh, planning on this next year. And I take responsibility for that too. Uh, in that I can do a better job and get out there and ask more questions. But uh, I am happy with the work that you're doing and I think we're lucky to have you. Um, I know that these numbers came up as I'm looking. Uh, it matched a lot what your self-evaluation was. Now, some of the certain scores and certain categories may not work that way, but it, the balance had the average. So I feel like you gave a good self-evaluation that kind of mirrored what a lot of us were thinking. And I'm just looking forward to to working on this and, and uh, getting into the process again next year and, and seeing how these things work themselves out. That's all I have. All right, next. I can chime in. <clears throat> so first, just clerical, uh, I'd love to see us get the numbers in first. And then if we want to review them, that would be great if we're going to continue with this um, style of evaluation just for the sake of time um and it'll have our names on it and we'll have numbers so we don't really have to say them out loud and then we can just kind of jump in so um clerically that's one two um a lot of these numbers <clears throat> that i put in there i put because what i saw in the last well since i've been on this board and since we started doing this I've seen um, on almost every category, I've seen improvement in the district. Um, regardless, you know, sometimes expectations might be through the roof compared to what needs to be done um, or what is trying to be done. But as far as like community relations, I I can tell you that I didn't even know what a pre what the, any of the previous uh, superintendents look like until they were standing in front of me and someone introduced them. Um, I can tell you that I talked to parents prior to this that had no idea what the superintendent looked like, who they were, when they were. I can tell you now that I talk to people. That's my favorite phrase. I talk to people because I talk to them. I talk to people. Um, <laughs> but whether it's patients at the clinic or it's, or it's fellow um, parents, um, other staff, community members, uh, they know who the majority of them know who CJ Anderson are. So... Um, I think that that is why my numbers are where they're at. I appreciate all the work he's put in. As far as one of them being relationship with the board, I can text this guy just about any time. He usually gives me an answer. When I first started this job, I'd ask, hey, would you guys know what's going on with this? And they'd never heard it. Now I can say, hey, do you know what's going on? And I can tell you that probably with a 90% accuracy, they were already on top of it. It's already taken care of. That happened today, actually. So I would say that's a big improvement that we're keeping track of things and that we're working towards being better. Um, administration of the school district, community relations. So as far as administration of the district, um, again, a lot less emails um, from staff, good, bad, or different. That's what's going on in my email box. Whereas when I first started, there were a lot more um, to me, that's, that's the only rubric I have. And so with that improvement, that's why I put that in there. So, but, um, again, just reiterate, I really appreciate all the work that's going in that you're doing. 
um, and while being a father, husband, and friend to others. So I appreciate it. Um, and then, like I said, please, can we make this a little less awkward, a little more efficient as we move forward? Sounds good. Would like to go next. Um, I'll just say that this was a little hard for me to fill out just because I've only been working with you for five months. So I was um, tried to be as fair and accurate as I could with my scores. Um, but I am looking forward to possibly switching this up to something that's more based on like what the strategic plan is and how you're doing with that and look forward to getting updates in these meetings on uh, what's happening in the district and how that up, um, applies to this strategic plan and just kind of evaluating you more on, on those goals that have been set for the district. And um, anyway, but I think you're doing a great job. The things that I feel like you could improve on, we've already talked about. And I think he's always completely open to honest conversation and shakes his head and says, you know, I'll try to do better. And anyway, I've enjoyed working with you and that's all I have to say. It's been, it's been like drinking through a fire hose for the last five months, but I'm, <laughs> I'm doing the best I can. So maybe by the next time we do this, I'll have a, it'll not be as hard for me. <laughs> I'll have a lot better idea of how things are going, how you're doing. Oh, good. For your first time. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> All right, Adriana, you ready? Yes. Okay. Well, I don't have a lot to say either. Um, what? Yeah. <laughs> <I'm just kidding>. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe five months, but only good things with me. I can see you working hard. Every time I have a question, you answer my questions, and I can see you working with everyone else and always happy and good attitude. So thank you for that. <laughs> thank you as well. All right. I'll go ahead and read Matt's. Oh I thought we were free. without extra commentary. <laughs> so, okay, so he uh, he just has it listed out relationship with the board. I feel that CJ has been prepared for every meeting, including those in which he attended remotely. I feel that overall CJ keeps the board informed adequately, and I have seen improvement in this area. I would like to see more information specifically as it pertains to the recent school security issues, perhaps in meetings with up to three trustees at a time. I feel CJ has done a good job of being familiar with policy, and I appreciate the proactive approach to updating policy. CJ has always been available when I have reached out to him, though I do not recall him seeking input from me often. I am not aware of any times in which CJ did not in, interpret the board's policy to the public. Okay, under administration of the school district, he says the central office staff seems to work well together and with CJ to the benefit of the district. I am not familiar with CJ's response time to issues. I am also not familiar with how he treats staff regarding respect and impartiality. CJ seems to make proactive efforts to keep the district staff motivated and in positive spirits, including being present at events. I am not familiar with how much collaboration CJ encourages. Under community relations, I am not familiar with how well CJ addresses concerns from the community. CJ seems to have a decent relationship with multiple people across multiple media outlets. It seems that CJ attends a lot of school events across the district. I've seen CJ at multiple community events that are not district related. It is my understanding that CJ is often available to community stakeholders. Under educational leadership, I feel that CJ presents himself and represents the district professionally. I am not aware of direct interaction with administrators, though I have seen general recommendations for continued improvement. I am aware of CJ making multiple visits to schools. I feel that CJ inspires through his public behavior and appearance. I do not recall CJ proactively presenting new ideas, though he does discuss student success options. I feel that CJ is well prepared for meetings and helps to prepare the board as well. I also feel the CJ has done a good job of compiling a well-performing cabinet team. CJ's presence at both school and community events are very beneficial to the district. I would like to see after action reports to members of the board in a non-public format following major issues 
that have occurred, particular, particularly school safety issues. While the number and amount of grants have increased, the budget standing to, let me see if I read that right. Okay, have increased the budget standing to some degree, only through controlling expenses can the budget become stabilized. I would like to see CJ have a more direct approach to reducing expenses. As evidenced by my assessment for the administration of the school district section, I would like to see slash hear more regarding these points. I rely on CJ to help me see through an education lens and would like to hear slash see more ideas directly from him with him remaining open to seeing issues through a non-education lens that can be presented by the board. So those are Matt's thoughts. <clears throat> All right. Um, I just have a couple, um, as far as strengths, I, I feel like you're very actively involved in the schools. People know who you are. They, they know you are going to be present for things. And I think that's fantastic. Um, you're definitely prepared for meetings and you're informed and you're working to inform the staff and community of the workings of the district. Also great. Um, I think it's nice to, to have you just out there. And again, people know who you are and um, you work hard with your staff and you work hard in the community. Um, I also think you're, you're actively working to give our district a direction with your team. And I think that's important as well. Um, as far as improvement or growth, um, I think building relationships with your staff by listening to and validating concerns could be very helpful and an area of growth. Um, also, kind of as Matt mentioned in his, um, just working with the budget. I know when, when numbers aren't your thing, it's easy to be like, okay, well, let's let's hope things go well. And I know you're working with, with Julie and her team. Um, numbers are not my favorite thing either, but I know we've got some pretty crazy numbers to crunch and so we're gonna have to figure things out. So I would say that's also an area of growth that um, you know I would like to see from you. Um, aside from that, it looks like it looks like as as far as numbers go, as far as the the um, comments from the board, I think we're going to keep you on. <laughs> That's part of what this evaluation does, right? Is we have to decide: Are we going to continue to keep CJ Anderson as our superintendent? And um, I don't see any big red flags that say, "Nope, let's fire him." at the end of his contract. Um, I, I see as there should always be areas of improvement because once you get to a point where you don't have to improve anymore, you just get to retire okay. or you should move on to a different job, right? Because you should always be improving. So um, as directed from the board, you've got some areas to work on. And we've also got a lot of things to say thank you for. Um, you're, you're still fairly new at this. We know you've got lots and lots of potential to to really bring our district through some really challenging times and we look forward to working with you to do so all right is there any other action or discussion from the board um, pertaining to the superintendent's evaluation okay action we need to take here I think we could probably potentially um, approve the evaluation. And by doing so, like I say, that would basically be like, hey, we're, we're going to keep this guy on. Please, let's not start another superintendent search. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Do we have a motion from the board? I move to approve the evaluation. Second. All right. We have a motion, a second. Any discussion? All right, all in favor of approving the evaluation, please say aye. 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 Any opposed nay? <clears throat> okay, chair votes aye and the motion carries. And um, I guess one other item of direction is just uh, bring back reports on those items that we've asked you to work on mm -hmm. throughout, throughout the next year and throughout our upcoming meetings. All right, item 2.4 is receipt of quarterly update report.
Chassie Stalky on her way. Good evening. Okay, so our office is pretty busy at this time. We are currently filling out all the applications for FY24, mainly for our formula funds that we receive, but we've also been in the process of applying for some um, competitive grants as well. So some new things that are going on. We've updated our FRL counts for our Title I schools. Northside and Grammar are now considered Title I schools. They received a new, the CEP status, it's the community eligibility provision. So basically um, Veronica and our food service department applies for that from the Department of Agriculture. And how they're eligible for that is because 40% of their student population are directly certified from the state to be FRL counts. So, and that the information comes from like SNAP, Medicaid, just state sponsored programs. So Catherine, FRL is free or reduced lunch. Okay. Just yeah, in just case. stop me if you yeah. need it. I'll go acronym <laughs> Sorry, we're talking crazy too many acronyms. if you want. <laughs> um, so with that, we still have all of our Wendover schools, Jackpot Elementary Middle School, and then all of Hawaii Combined School, as well as Southside, our additional Title I schools. But one thing that our schools are facing right now is with the addition of two schools, that money is allocated by the population at each school. So if we add additional students, all the other schools allocations go down. So our schools right now are trying to figure out how they're able to keep some programming. Um, they're all able to keep staff, but just kind of crunching in that sense as well. We just submitted a $500,000 application to the Department of Justice for an additional COPS grant. We received one last year but we're applying to help kind of supplement or complete the funding for the safety project that we have. When we initially were working on that project, we were thinking it was gonna be about $2 million. Right now it's coming about to 4.2 million. So that additional half a million, hopefully we get that. And then that will help cover the cost of the camera systems and telecommunication systems at Carlin, one West Wendover, I want to say high school, and I'm sorry, I don't remember off the top of my head, and jackpot. So, And I believe Stephen's not here, but I believe we're focusing on the rural schools just because Jeff Bowers with Innovative Community, it's easier for him to get that done if he's able to just go out those. So we're going to do those schools first, the larger population, and then continue working down the list. We also just applied for the Safer Community Stronger Connections Grant, BISCA. It was a bipartisan bill that is funneling through NDE, and we applied for three point, well, three million dollars, three million sixty-eight thousand dollars to also help with that project. Um, if you start doing the math, that does go over, but we also added about a half a million dollars in there for Centegic Crisis Alert System. So this is something that other districts within the state currently have that we don't. And let me read off the description because I won't say it properly. So it's an emergency notification system designed to quickly alert school administrators, staff, first responders in the event of a crisis. So they're badges basically, and they have certain triggers. I'm gonna say Morse code, right? But if you push the button so many times, does different things. You can alert internally, you can alert to outside parties. So we're applying for that system as well within the BISCA grant. Um, at the end of FY23 this year, our office has received about $21 million in grant funding. Out of that 21 million, 16 of that was federal funds. And Julie kind of touched base on this. We've been talking about cutting expenses and how we can move forward. One thing as an initiative that we've seen, there is a supplement supplant law. And we've noticed that over the years, we've had programming that's been working at our title schools that's been provided by federal funds. And the more schools that have been coming in and actually using those programs, now the districts is covering that expense. 
which becomes a supplanting issue because it's no longer supplemental at the other schools if it's a district-wide initiative. So to help relieve the general fund, we're gonna take communities and schools out of the general fund and then pay for that expense out of our at-risk weighted funds. That annually is about $360,000. And then we talked about the Friday initiative where the US Department of Agriculture, they will help cover the expense for the rules, correct? Um, for the rules, if there's at least 30 minutes of instructional enrichment activity. So that'll help offset some of those expenses that we didn't budget for. Um, but we still have Elko and Spring Creek. So we're using at-risk funding to cover the meals for lost revenue there as well as that instructional time, if it is provided. Uh, let's see, another thing, we're hitting the COVID cliff now. We've already expended all of our SR1 funds. SR2 expires September of FY23. So in a few months, right now we have about $700 left in that, so that's gone. SR3, I believe there's about a million dollars left. It's all encumbered and it's all salaries. Um, one thing that we've used with ESSER funds is to cover summer school. So going next year, we're not gonna have money for summer school. So that'll also be coming out of at risk. We do have it for this year out of AB 495, which was a state grant that we received that was a set aside from NDE. So all the COVID money came through, it went to the state and then the state was allowed to keep 5% and a lot of that they went towards competitive grants that the LEAs were allowed to apply for. So with the AB 495, we use that for summer school. We used it for paper and Elevate, I believe. I think the last thing that I have there is our risk assessment. So you probably see me more up here in the last couple of years with policies and everything else. And it all falls back to this risk assessment that I've been talking about. Last year, we scored um, low risk assessment. This was moderate this year. Julie and I just met with Amelia at the state and we were able to mitigate some of it. I think initially our score was like a 36. We got it down to 24, but we're still on that moderate. If you look at page four, you can see the scoring rubric on there. So we're currently medium risk. And you can go through the rubric and it'll show you their scoring system. Um, Julie and I did make some comments. So if we have any transition in staff, we automatically get dinged. If we have a new superintendent, we get dinged. If I submit a grant and they have a comment, we get dinged. So everything going down the list, they can, they have the score zero through five. Um, the ones that we scored the highest on was on page three, you can see we got an eight on row one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, an eight on row eight were applications, revisions and amendments corrected or accurate. So I worked with my counterparts at the other state and we felt that this was an inaccurate way to score. Um, for the size of our district and how much funding we have going in and out, we have about 40 applications going in and out at all times with multiple revisions. They're using the same range for us as they would use for Lyon County, Eureka County. So when you think about it in a sense, if I'm funneling revisions for $20 million and I only have eight comments come back, I score an eight. But if a smaller district or a larger one, Washoe, has dealing with more money, you have to think about that score as proportional to the actual amount of comments and corrections that they're making within the full span of how much funding is coming in. So they're looking at changing that next year, which will actually benefit us if they're able to use that, like is it a proportion in comparison to how much funding we have? Um, another thing I wanted to bring up, this risk assessment last year was the first year that they pilot, piloted it. This is the second year it is gonna be something new. Julie and I 
go to a conference every year by the Brewman Group. That's legal counsel that we sometimes use as well as the state of Nevada and, and other states. And Nevada made headlines. So <laughs> it, was, it was kind of embarrassing to see us up there, but it had nothing to do with us. So in the state of Nevada was aud audited in FY21. And you can see that on our corrective action plan on page four, we had two deficiencies. So one, they're requiring more robust financial management policies and internal controls for the purpose of managing our federal funds and then just security. Our second one is they want me to develop a reporting tracker that I can use basically if I, if something were to happen to me and someone would have to step into my position, they would know all of the daily duties, what's due, any reporting activity. So those are two things that we're gonna develop. In FY21, Nevada was audited and on their report, they were dinged because they had a lack of policies and procedures as well. They also had a lack of internal risk identification and assessment process and process for monitoring their LEAs. So this was the outcome of that. And then the state's still trying to figure it out every year. Um, we've been in a good position this last year. We've been working really closely with the state and kind of developing a relationship and telling them what our problems are and you know, just trying to work together because they don't always understand the difficulties that we're facing and we don't know on their side either. I think that's it. If there's any questions. Any questions from the board? And I guess I should comment on the risk assessment score. I was just working on a grant application right now. So I do turn in a pre-award risk assessment. So I've already done ours for FY24. And then they base that. They do a risk assessment at the beginning of the fiscal year and then at the end. This was the ending one. Um, and then if we were to be at a high risk, that's basically, we can still apply for funding, most likely competitive funds we're not gonna be eligible for. Um, there's more of a chance that NDE would come and you have on-site monitoring um, and be looking more into just our internal controls. They'd be asking for more documentation and trying to place more control on the LEA in general. So. Just so you know. Questions from the board? So how do we have a, is there somewhere I can go to look? You don't necessarily have to answer, but other than, is there somewhere I can go look or someone can look for other districts in their risk assessment? Like, is it available online? I do believe it's available and I don't know what page, but it is public information, I believe. So should we should be able to get it just to see, I guess, Comparatively, mm -hmm. how did we do? That's what you we know. have the exact same score as Washoe. So, um, and when I talked to the other districts, it seems like right now Clark, Washoe, ourselves, and I were all moderate risk. Um, I work really closely with the, I'll see the ladies in those other counties, and we pretty much all got dinged on the same things. So, okay. so it's not like we're being singled out. A single No, not at all. Yeah. That no. No, and like I said, we're definitely working with NDE and each other. Um, they're providing a lot of professional development for us. And just their GMU is the grant management unit in at the state. They've been working closely trying to be transparent on what exactly they're seeing, what they need. Um, and in the next year, I think within like two months, we have we have monthly PD sessions with them where they'll go over compliance and risk and they'll go over the difference between a policy and an internal control, what they recommend, what they want to see. So it's, it's developing and it's just going to be a process I foresee. So that was my next comment slash question was just, this is a process, a new process within the state, mm -hmm. just like the financial side is a new process within the state. So it's not like, it's something that the district, we were working on it, but it's not like there was something within the district that we had that we were missing or anything other no. than, okay, so I, yeah. not that I would think that anyways, but. No, and you can look back at our audits. It's just a way, and 
I'm going to just be frank. It's just a way for NDE just to make sure that when they're getting money from the feds, that they're able to meet their own auditing and a way to have controls as well. It's all about checks and balance, internal controls. So. Appreciate you. Mm -hmm. What does being at medium risk mean for our district fiscally? Um, so like I said, at this point, there's nothing. We're gonna still continue to most likely, we still get all our formula funding. Um, I'm still able to apply for any competitive grants. Um, like I said, if it just comes down to we're at a high risk, if a grantor is looking at it and they see that we're a high risk district, they might plan if they do wanna give us the funding, they're gonna come on site more and they're gonna make sure that Julie and I are handling the finances. They're gonna make sure that we have proper inventory controls, you know, just proper guidance policies and rules that we're actually controlling that money um, and using it for the correct purpose. It's just, just the risk assessment, you would have to think it's basically a promise. And that's just a statistical factor. If you're gonna give somebody money um, what's the likelihood that they're going to do the, the appropriate thing with it? All right, any other questions? I don't have a question, okay. but thank you for like updating our policies that needed that type of thing. And just, we would be lost without grant money. <laughs> We'd really be in trouble. So thanks for doing that. Yeah, and we're excited in my office. Um, we have one more full-time person that's helping me. So it's actually relieving a lot of the stress off my position. So that way I'm able to find more funding for the district. So that's exciting. Yeah. Okay. Awesome, thanks, Cassie. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to item 3.1, our consent agenda. I move to approve the consent agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second, any discussion? All right, all in favor of approving the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Chair votes aye and the consent agenda is approved. Item 4.1 is a report from our NASB director. All right, not a whole lot to go over. We're still watching, um, you know, what's going on in the legislature. I've been passing along those weekly updates to you. Uh, but a couple deadlines coming up. May 26th, just a couple days from now, is the deadline for bills to make it through the second house or, or they won't. Uh, continue on. And then May 31st, we have all the budget bills uh, being introduced. And as I had mentioned earlier, that could get interesting. Um, you know, we're hoping everything goes well, but there is a possibility. Uh, there's some contention between the governor and the legislature on different, a few different items in the budget. I know one of them had to do with uh, the uh, charter school part of the uh, or school choice, I'm sorry, that uh, the governor's pushing for. And so, again, that remains to be seen what happens with that. But uh, that's really all I have on this one. I'll have a lot more next meeting after some of these deadlines pass and we see what makes it through. But I would urge you to, if you haven't, check out those emails I've been sending with the uh, the NASB weekly report. They have a lot of great information and talk about uh, some different bills. So uh, that's all I have today. All right, any questions or guidance for Jeff? All right, we'll move on to item two, or sorry, 4.2 items from board members. I have just a couple. Mm -hmm. um, one, like we had discussed earlier at our other meeting, um, I would like to see a different superintendent evaluation based on the goals that we are developing. Um, I also would like to see that checklist used for like programs um, and one that just popped to my head because Cassie had mentioned it was like uh, the program paper, um, you know, has it been effective, that type of thing. I won't go into more detail because we already have. Um, and I would like, uh, I was thinking, I spoke with Julie about a possible date about, so it would be no later than March, but like January to March or so of looking at school budgets and figuring out where, and Brooke, you will know what I'm talking about, like where the schools are sitting, like are they high spending, high scoring, I guess, um, or are they low spending, the high score, like just that whole thing of, um, and involving principals of maybe they need more at one school and another. Um, I just think that would be a good 
way to look at things as well, um, or just another method. And um, I'd also like to see Mr. Anderson's, um, based on like the consent agenda of seeing um, travel requests ahead of time and just knowing um, where uh, the trip is and what the purpose of it. And then how is that information going to be shared when you return um, with uh, district staff or whoever that is, as well as us, just so we're aware of what's happening with that, um, including a time card, I think, because that's what others have. So I don't know if the rest of you agree with that or not. Um, so just my board comment. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any other items from board members? Yeah, I just wanted to bring up, um, because it helped me a lot, this finance um, class that we took workshop. And I, I, I'm hoping you guys got, it's um, announcing fall e-lab workshop. It's an email from Jordan Tolufson. And it's talking about being able to take the four part virtual workshop, Wild Ride Ahead, which will focus on district finances post ESSER funding. And it had a ton of great information in it. They're offering a fully funded uh, workshop to the first 100 board members that apply. I applied, got right in. Um, I think it would be something really beneficial for everyone on this board to take. It just it had a lot of great information in there. So that's my two cents. Was that, so, was that in the emails? Yeah, it's in our emails. Can you do me a favor, just resend it to me just to make sure. sure. Yeah. I don't know if I have it or not. Yeah, and it's a $850 <clears throat> per person class that you can get if, if you get in to, or if you're quick enough to be one of the first 100, you get it for free. So. I'm wondering if they just sent it to you, the, the folks that went at first, because I just did a search and I have the original from Jordan, but I don't have anything else. Oh, maybe it is. Might so be, is this I part two for us? Up too. <laughs> Well, I'll I'll leave an email and see if they're it to them though, because it's open yeah. to anybody. It's not just if yeah, you're I'm going to forward this to you because it was full of a lot of really good information, just on how to even look at when there's huge budgets to look at, just kind of what numbers to pull and lots of ideas. So I thought it was really beneficial and really easy to take. It was like two days a week, um, but only for two hours. For a Thursday morning and like a Friday morning, and then um, the same thing the next week, and everything's recorded and sent to you, so you can even refer back to it later if you need to, or if you miss a session, or if you miss a session, to. yeah. We'll be in class together then. Yay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Any other board member items before we move on? I do. I just want to circle back and just caution against, um, you know, we have contracted contracts and contracts, especially with the superintendent and the other, other members. Um, it's, it can be cumbersome to try and put in things like time cards and um, those types of things. Um, and then also, if I remember right, somewhere in the contract, it stated that the superintendent was... Um, authorized to attend the meetings prior. I don't know that it has to check in with us per contract. So I, I understand where you're going with it, but I think our contract already authorizes him to do it. Now we can double check on that. That's, that's cool. But I just was, was thinking back to that random things popped in my head. So, but I don't know that we, that, that we necessarily have that. I don't know if we want to change that contract or whatnot with Mr. Anderson or look into that then. Totally understand. I know where you're going, though. We need to look at everything, see see stuff. But well, it's more who's going to be signing off on it. <clears throat> I don't know that he has to check in with us based on it contract. It has to be signed by even a time card. Who keeps track of personal days, vacation days, then who is going to sign that? Since we are the one in charge of him, that's what I'm getting at. Because I don't want to put that on somebody else because that's not their place. So as a board, we would check. We would check do a time card based as a board, we would go through, I'm, I'm trying to understand, like, so as a board, seven members, we would go through his, when he was in the office and when he wasn't. I don't, I'm, It'd be no different than any other employee. They do the same thing. Everyone, cause we have to keep track of, he has personal days, he has vacation days. 
those have to be accounted for. So since we're in charge of him, and maybe we don't need, maybe that I just, hmm. I think we can look into that, but, but uh, you know, we, we don't run the, the money or the, you know, the time cards, things like of that nature, like you're talking about, that's, that's not really our responsibility. Yes, he's our employee. We evaluate him. We hire a superintendent. We can look into that and see, but I, I don't I think, think that's sure. under our purview. All right. if, if it's helpful, I can see how other districts yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely manage that. Yeah. That'd be great. All right, any other items? I know, Catherine? Um, so I know that the falsified school shooting phone calls are like a nationwide thing, but I was wondering at this district level, is there anything that is or moreover could be done about that? Because I know that like Elko High School has had two, Spring Creek I think is also a two, and like Wells I think had one as well, but I was wondering if like, is there anything happening or could there anything be happening in the area? Uh, could you clarify what your question, like, could there be any? Like, I don't know. Like, like, like are we doing yeah. something to address it? Is yeah. that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I think probably the best answer from that standpoint is, uh, you know, with every, with every, everything that goes on in our, in our lives and in our schools, we learn from past experience. And so, um, the, yeah, the swatting calls, as they're called um uh obviously bring a new opportunity for us to learn from our our response procedures uh most of what happens there as far as response goes is uh rests on the shoulders of our first responders of our excellent sros led by sergeant Brubieska, and um as well as how our administrators communicate with central office and then we how we communicate out to to families um and so with every with every situation that occurs, we, I can tell you what we do from our end is after we're done, there's always a, the, the police do, and, and the first responders do their own debriefs afterwards to say, hey, how can we do that better? Um, how can we be a little faster? That sort of thing. And we do the same on our end when they're done with theirs, we debrief together with law enforcement to say, hey, this is maybe an area where we might've had an oversight or maybe didn't respond as quickly as we could. And um, I've, I feel like already from the first one we had this year to the third one we had, our processes got faster. I know Kayla was tearing her hair out a little bit after the first one and then, and she wasn't tearing her hair out after the third one. <laughs> like we're, we're, we're getting better. There's always more we can do. Um, as far as like stopping the calls, there's really nothing that can be done about that. Like people who want to be malicious, people who want to make calls are going to make calls, but uh, what we can, we you always talk about controlling what you can control and what we can control is how we respond to that and what protocols and procedures we have in place. And we're always honing those to be better, whether it's, whether it's a fake call or a real incident, we, we treat everything as if it's serious and, and how we respond to it. So does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. All right. Anything else before we move on to item 5.1? Uh, just board comment. I just want to comment on our student board member and how amazing she is. We've had lots of different student board members in here and they've all been great, but I just feel like she has asked and some amazing questions and given some good input in and I just want to say how impressed I am and glad to have you here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> For sure. Thank you. All right, Mr. Anderson. Does that mean we're moving to we're the We're moving next? to 5.1. Okay, all right. <laughs> yes, we're moving to 5.1. <laughs> okay. Um, so a few things just to uh, thank you for uh, the evaluation and the direction. I um, also appreciate the time during the other uh, meeting we had today to talk about goals and how we can continue to move forward as a district. Um, just want to mention a few things to keep you informed. Uh, anyone who can attend. So this entire week, they've they've been doing and will continue to do the level up for health at Spring Creek Middle School throughout the week. Um, Thursday from five to seven, there is a kind of like a carnival community event similar to the one that they did at Flag View about a month ago. Um, so that's that's something to, to check out if you haven't been before. Um, a few administrator updates. Um, uh, 
our Spring Creek High School is going to have a new principal next year, and that is going to be uh, Mr. Wade Pearson. He is the current, he's one of the current vice principals at Spring Creek High School, and he will be the principal of Spring Creek High School next year. So congratulations to Mr. Pearson. Um, he'll be the, he's a good man for the job. Um, uh, Mr. Streeter, who is the current principal at Owyhee Combined Schools, uh, is uh, being transferred over to Battleborn Youth Challenge Academy, giving them a principal again. And we will be interviewing tomorrow for, uh, for the principal of Owyhee Combined Schools job. And we've got what we think are three pretty great candidates, actually, to choose from. So we're, we're going we're gonna to be up in Owyhee tomorrow. If anyone's looking for me at central office, that's where we'll be tomorrow afternoon. Um, next Tuesday, we're gonna have our, our, a capital improvement committee meeting. We were able to get participation from the majority of people we invited. I think there's two communities, uh, West Wendover did not respond to the request to participate and uh, Jackpot did not respond, but everybody else did. And I'm not saying that to call anyone out, but I do wanna make sure that I'm, everyone was invited <laughs> and most have responded. Um, we would love to have their participation as well, but we will, we will be uh, engaging in our capital improvement committee meeting. They've, they've got a copy of the facilities assessment. They've got a copy of our capital improvement plan, and we're going to talk about those items at our meeting next Tuesday. <clears throat> and and then just let you know, I'm, I've become involved uh, on the board of directors for the United Way of Northern Nevada, I think it's what it is. I'm just getting integrated into it. Summer uh, Stevens, Churchill's superintendent is leaving and she's vacating that position and they've requested our involvement to represent Northern Nevada in the rural schools. And what they do a lot from that standpoint is literacy. Um, initiatives and opportunities for students. And so Candace and I are looking into what they have to offer. And uh, just today we were talking about how important early childhood literacy is, and that will hopefully be something that will help bolster that and contribute to our efforts towards early childhood literacy as part of your goals, as well as part of our strategic plan. And I will conclude with that. All right, thank you. Any questions for our superintendent? I said one um, question. It's a question, no assumptions here. Um, as far as like, cause we know one of our biggest expenditures is like diesel going through the roof or whatever. Do we, are we, do we have a process? I know we have a process for routes, right? For buses to go routes and trying to find the best possible there. Do we have a process to try and see any reduction as that? Or is that just the, is the route process what we're trying to do with fuel? I'm just saying, is there some way that we, what I'm asking is, is there some way we can find out if there's some way to reduce fuel? I would say that the quickest way to reducing fuel costs would be reducing how much we travel outside of school routes. So if we really wanted to get into the nitty gritty of fuel, yeah. we may have to start looking at uh, whether or not we want to send students on trips places yeah i just was i just i don't necessarily want to our, our routes are, just asking questions before we ask questions yeah like, no that's great i would say that our routes are pretty much already developed in kind of the most efficient manner they can um uh, for multiple reasons but yeah they're 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 pretty well developed at this point and um yeah, so I'm, I'm not advocating for cutting student trips for things but i'm saying not either. It, that that a, a, a route around Elko uh, for morning pickup and drop off is much less costly than um, a, a trip out to Vegas with 12 kids on a bus. Yes. Uh, so it's just it, bang for your buck. You're, you're, I don't think we're going to save a whole lot of diesel on our, our routes around town. Cool. Just popped into my head. So. Yeah. No, thanks. thanks for asking. I did forget one thing. Sorry. Um, we did a lot of athletics recognition today. Um, Robert McEnany, who's a senior at Spring Creek High School, he won a state title in international extemporaneous speaking for speech and debate. And uh, I think it's speech and debate. Yeah, it's speech and debate. And uh, I think he gets to go to nationals for that. So I wanted to shout that one out too. His dad was here earlier, but dad's gone. <laughs> but we're shouting him out anyway. Nope. Nope. Not on a bus. Saving diesel. <laughs> All right, we will move on to item 6.1, approval of the accounts payable. Move to approve the accounts payable. Thank you, do we have a second? Second. 
We have a motion and a second. Any discussion, disclosures, or abstentions? It's on. I have to disclose I have a family member that owns one of these companies, so I'm abstaining from voting. Thank you. Turn on the mic. I'm going to disclose that I have a close relative that works for Wells Real Electric that won't be abstaining from voting. All right, and my disclosure is the same as Brooks, and I will also not be abstaining. Any other discussion on the um, accounts payable? All right. All in favor of approving the accounts payable, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Chair votes aye, and with one abstention, the motion carries. Teresa. Yep. May I say one more thing? I neglected to mention one very important thing for my superintendent's Please report. say it before we close. In the back of the room is Sergeant Anna Brubieska. This last week, Sergeant Brubieska graduated with her master's degree from University of Reno, Nevada uh, in social work. Is that correct? A degree, master's degree in social work. Um, which is not only impressive given the, the ungodly amount of hours she spends as a police officer um, serving our county and our schools, uh, but she also is pretty instrumental and uh, important in our um, mental wellness, the way we respond to student uh, uh, mental wellness concerns for, so for both staff and students. She is knee deep in that and she is a huge part of all that for us and um so we're really feel so proud of her and i know she loves the attention but it's it's amazing i'm just really proud of her and i just want to know that's it right. i told you it was important I it was important earlier, and then i forgot congratulations <laughs> anna <laughs> all right uh 7.1 is final opportunity for public comment Seeing none, we will adjourn the meeting. Thank you everyone for being here.